and thank you for joining us for the GIS Day event, okay? After 20 months of the, talking through the camera, I still can't get used to it. I need to see some faces. Any faces out there? Anya. Oh, Lauren. Okay, thanks, Lauren. Shall I talk to you? Please. Okay. GIS Day is a day to help others learn about geography and the real-world applications of GIS that are making a difference to our communities. Is it a chance for you to share your accomplishments and inspire others to discover and use GIS? I think it's a lot more relevant as well with the historical events that have been happening in Glasgow, okay, with climate change and everything like that. So I think this all ties in together. This year, the Society for Conservation GIS and Asian South Africa have teamed up to showcase the inspiring work that is being done in conservation. Asian South Africa is committed to supporting conservation organizations through continuous innovation and a common understanding. Over the years, we have built a strategic partnership with the Society for Conservation GIS, which is an all-volunteer non-profit organization. Society for Conservation GIS, globally using GIS information systems through communication, networking, scholarships, and training. Italy, South Africa are passionate about and take care of our conservation community in Southern Africa and also in Africa in general. And we hope that we can continue to help you, our clients, by simplifying decisions and making a positive difference to help conserve and protect our communities. Hopefully you'll have a good event day. Thank you very much. And I'll pass you over to Barosha. Over to you now. And Thank please don't look at the camera. <laughs> I'll look at Lauren. Thank you, Patrick. Good morning to everyone. Uh, wish, I wish you all a very happy GIS day. I am Barosha Naidu, and I'm so excited to start today's event. But before we start today's event, let's have a look at our agenda quickly. First up, we have a quick discussion with our SCGIS team. There afterwards, we followed by three young scholars from Southern Africa that will share their conservation solutions with us using ESB technology. We will then be followed with a Q&A. So I would like to invite the audience to utilize our Q&A chat functionality, and we will facilitate these questions at the end of our session one. There afterwards, it's all fun and games with Lawrence Sweden at 11.05, and we'll kick off with a 15 minute interval to proceed with our, with our session two. I would now like to ask two of my most valuable conservationists in Southern Africa to join me on camera for a quick CGIS discussion. Mervyn Nato and Craig Beach will be representing the SCGIS community. Morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody. Morning, Craig. Morning, Mervyn. Happy GIS Day to you both. Thank you. Thank you for all the listeners. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to go straight into the mix. So we all hear about the CSGIS uh, committee. Mervyn and uh, Craig, I'm not sure who's going to answer first, but let's go with Craig. What is the CSGIS community all about? And why is it so important for a conservationist to be part of this uh, amazing community? Well, I think it's exactly that, Barosha. It's all about community and collaboration and knowledge sharing. And, um, and it's actually something wonderful that was started um, a couple of decades ago by Charles Convis um, and some other ESRI colleagues um, through their conservation program that they've been running for uh, a similar amount of years. And, um, and what it does is it draws together and creates this network of collaboration and um, knowledge exchange, as I said. And, um, and it's just wonderful to see how the community, you know, gather together um, and they share annually with a conference, um, obviously being virtual the last two years, but every other year it's an in-person conference where conservationists get together um, in parts of California alongside the ESRI user conference. And, um, and it's a three, four day um, experience where you know, networking takes place and it goes deep into the night. Um, so conservationists can be nocturnal as well. So it really does play very well into the framework of creating this network and um, sharing of knowledge. Yeah. Great. And just to, just to jump in there, so I'd like to add that uh, SEJS, um, the, the, let's say the global, we have the global um, SEJS office, which is really, they have their um, nonprofit registered in the USA, but they support a global network of JS users. And, it is entirely volunteer uh, run. 
they have no uh, paid staff and they rely heavily on their little committees which would help to, for example, run with the finances, um, help with the website. The website is quite a key um, means of communication with its members. Um, through the website, it provides access to things like webinars, um, conference proceedings, they have a job board. Uh, the SUJS has a listserv of, I think, over 1,800 JS users worldwide. And through this listserv, it really provides um, great technical advice and support if any of its users are struggling with any issues. Um, they're usually posted on the listserv. So, um, yeah, a great organization of just willing to help one another, in a sense. That's fantastic. So as an audience member, and I'm, obviously I'm really excited about this community, how do I actually join this SCGIS uh, community? So we have, so SCGIS has a website, which is probably its primary means of communication um, for, for new members and the likes. And historically, up until this year, um, the membership was really focused, Lisa, I think there was a bias towards um, the global, the USA actually, um, where most of the members are. And the membership was $50 per annum. But as of this year, and about, I think actually only about two months ago, they implemented a new um, membership fee of $10 now, which then provides members to um, access to, let's say, the past conference proceedings, the listserv. Um, since 2016, we've been hosting the uh, Esri UC uh, tech, uh, tech workshop video. So I think each year at um, the Esri User Conference is about two to 300 technical videos, which are recorded. And then we can we, we provide that to the members, obviously um, to yeah, free of charge to those members who have signed up. Um, but yeah, the www.scjs.org is the website, an easy one. Fantastic. So uh, obviously, you know, every community or group has, has some sort of bylaws. Um, Mervyn, would you like to maybe share those bylaws with us? So that's interesting because, I mean, as I said, they're, they're, as, a organ, as a non-profit, they're registered in the state of Montana um, but, and managed by a board of directors that serve a three-year term. But I think what's really unique or interesting about it is that um, in the bylaws, they have a statement that says when uh, members are gathered in a, as a society, they'll not allow harm to come to colleagues by word or deed. Um, and at all times, members will not allow harm to come to the natural environment by their technology or actions, which I think is quite unique. And it's actually does say a lot about the, the character and the nature of the organization and uh, their purpose really. That's great. Craig, maybe um, would you like to let us know what are the men membership benefits? So if I have to obviously join the community, what are my benefits as a conservationist? Well, as I mentioned earlier, and um, so just perhaps a little bit about our chapter, which is what we're calling the Southern African chapter. Um, you will see um, from the link that Mervyn shared and, and how SCGI is structured is that pretty much countries become very become respect, representative chapters to, to the Society of Conservation GIS. And what we've done, what we've chosen to do is to collaborate with Southern African countries to bring about that chapter. So, um, and, and again, what it is, is we hope to share knowledge and, and to share um, information and best practices all around the ethos um, that, that that Mervyn shared on. So, um, yeah, so that, that, that's pretty much what it is. And we, we look to, in the future, have at least one, year, one event annually, um, which hopefully will become an in-person event. Um, but otherwise, you know, we'll be sharing knowledge and, and exchanging webinars um, and, and so on through, throughout, or maybe more than once a year. Um, and, and that just builds up the network that we, we hope to create and have as part of the CGI. 100%. And I love the fact that you've mentioned best practices. So if I'm a conservationist and I'm busy with a project in area A uh, and I don't know how to use my uh, technology and, you know, any sort of documentation, I can actually call the both of you and you can advise me what would be the best way forward in order to execute uh, the use of my technology. Would I be correct in saying that? Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and what we hope to do is catalyze that, that first inception phase or that kicking, getting going phase that um, individuals find themselves in and, and you know, just fast track that so that they can get to implementing and, and making a difference to the environment sooner and, and, and on a greater scale. So that's what we hope to achieve. And if I can just 
jump in there um, to add on to what uh, Craig was saying just now about the South the Southern African SCJs chapter. So um, they're about so SCJs, um, let's say global. They have about 19 chapters um, around the world. And the idea is to try and embed these chapters in developing countries where um, they can then try and be a means of communication, try and share a lot of what ECJ uh, is trying to achieve in supporting conservation GIS. But you'll learn more about uh, the scholarship program um, shortly and that through the Southern African chapter, the South African one now, the idea is that that Southern African chapter would um, reach out to the conservation GIS users and then um, provide them with an application form to complete and to receive it. They review it and then make recommendations due to SEJs. So the chapter has a very important role in trying to um, really expand conservation GIS through um, encouraging what we call uh, the, the Global Scholarship Program. Great. Marvin, I know that the SEGIS Scholarship Program is very close to your heart. Would you kindly unpack the program for us? Hi, everyone. Today I'd like to tell you about the SEGIS Global Scholarship Program. The Global Scholarship Program falls under the SEGIS International Committee, one of the three focal areas. Um, the other two are the Train the Trainer Program, which I'll tell you about more shortly, and then supporting the SEGIS International Chapters, such as the one which Craig Beach leads, the Southern African Chapter. The scholarship program started back in 1997, and SEGIS provided training to more than 450 uh, conservation practitioners based uh, in 78 countries from around the world, and that's a very competitive program, and these are really the future GIS leaders in their own respective countries. The idea being that we try and provide training um, to applicants who may not be, who may not have easy access to good GIS training or be afforded the opportunity to participate in uh, events such as the ECGIS uh, conference or the ESRI user conference. So we select between 15 and 20 scholars annually, um, focus being on developing countries, as mentioned, and we would bring them across to California for a month and the training would usually start off with two or three weeks um, training in ArcGIS Desktop, um, historically ArcMap and Arc Catalog, but these days it is in ArcGIS Pro. They would then also travel to Redlands, um, which is the ESRI uh, headquarters, and um, yeah, get to meet a lot of the, so the, the folks, maybe um, participate in some of the development lab um, workshops, and um, they receive training in ArcGIS Online, story maps, dashboard, and some of the mobile um, apps at Redlands. They then get to participate in the uh, ESRI user conference, and we usually try and have them participate or present their own research, and the SEGIS conference where they present their own research and get to meet with the SEGIS members and uh, yeah, present their work and um, start building um, that community of practice. They also, Charles Connors often ensures that they receive um, some of the older ESRI training laptops and um, access to uh, the SEGIS, no, the ESRI ArcGIS Pro desktop software. Um, so they can go home and continue the, the good work and the training that they received, continue to implement that. The, we then have our train the trainer program. So that started in 2011. And the idea there would be that if we could rather bring back some of these fallers, these former scholars and empower them to be able to provide training back home, then we have much greater impact and improving and building on the JS capacity worldwide. Um, Jack Dangerman is very supportive of the Train the Trainer program, as well as the Global Scholars program. And the image in the top right, um, that's Jack in the middle, and that's Charles Converse, who has been really um, a stalwart in supporting SEGIS and Conservation GIS for many years. He's currently employed with um, ESRI, Inc. Um, and yeah, it's just a uh, image taken with John Schaefer. He really, um, him and Patty formed um, Juniper JS, and they've been providing the training to scholars for many years in ArcMap and Arc Catalog. But since the move across to Pro, he's now stepping down. But in 19, 2019, he received the special achievement award from Jack, which is quite a, a, a really amazing feat and a testament to the great work that he's doing. So the vision for the Train the Train program is to build a resilient, borderless community of conservation geospatial technology trainers who empower those who are acting in defense of nature and culture to create a better world. 
Uh, we currently have 27 trainers from 21 different countries. The map just shows you where they're all located. And um, to date, the trainer trainer instructors have taught um, over 1,600 uh, students, which is a really amazing achievement and a great way for really expanding our GA's capacity. To look at the way forward, um, in 2021, the scholarship program was offered virtually, um, although we're going to try and have it in person next year at, in California. Um, be migrating all the training material across from ArcMap to ArcGIS Pro and then trying to keep the manuals update. Um, the, the ArcGIS Pro is um, growing and building in functionality with each release, so it's hard to stay abreast of all the changes, but we're trying to do so. It really is an amazing uh, software. And yeah, looking at the future for the train the trainers and the scholarship program is really looking at improving our uh, offering on mobile apps, ArcGIS Online, and the ArcGIS for Solutions, ArcGIS Solutions for Conservation. For anybody interested in participating in next year's Global Scholarship Program, please reach out to me at mlotter.scgis.org or mervinlotter at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melvin, for unpacking the SCGIS program. I see there's a lot of work that's been doing that you've been doing in this, in this community. So thank you for that. Um, I would like to remind you all to kindly use the Q&A to post your comments, questions, and we will provide you with feedback at the end of our session one. Uh, let's go over and highlight three of our Southern Africa scholars that have been awarded the SCGIS program. They will use their learning outcomes and provide provide us with presentations to show us their conservation solutions within their organization. Good afternoon. My name is Debbie Jurd and I'm a conservation scientist working for Ezemvelo KZN Wildlife. Today, I'd like to chat to you a little bit more about the conservation maps we have created to assist conservation planning in the province. My current role in the organization is as a conservation scientist and I focus on ecosystems, looking at big picture things like climate change, impacts on ecosystems and loss of habitat. I'm also a qualified drone pilot and the flight operations manager for drones in the, in the organization. Before I show you some of my work, I'd like to chat to you a little bit more about the Society for Conservation GIS Scholarship Program and their Train the Trainer Program. The society offers a wonderful scholarship where the lucky recipient gets to go over to America and attend the ESRI um, user conference in San Diego, an amazing event, the SCGIS conference in Monterey, receive GIS training at the University of California, Davis, some more training at Redlands, and then possibly participate in the Train the Trainer program. I was a lucky recipient of the scholarship in 2012 and without that I wouldn't have been able to do some of the work that I will show you later on. Some of the scholars are welcome back to become a train the trainer and this enables those scholars to train other conservation people in their home countries and thus extend the reach of the SCGIS program. I was trained as a trainer in 2014 and then I was a lucky recipient to be able to go back overseas in 2019 for the Train the Trainer program where we were trained in the ArcGIS Pro software. So now let me show you some of the examples of the GIS I've done and I will show you how I've examined global change threats, land cover change and climate change specifically, and their impacts on savannas and grassland systems in KZN and how we use that to plan for change. So let, look, let's look at land cover change. We are lucky enough to have a suite of land cover maps to use to aid conservation planning. And we can reclass these land cover maps into just two categories. The gray category, which is anthropogenically transformed categories, such as buildings, roads, dams, agriculture areas, and timber plantations, and then green, the natural habitat remaining. And then we can step through time and show the loss of habitat over time. So here we start in 1990 and 2017, back to 1990 and 2017. And you can see visually the massive loss of habitat we have had in the province. We can also see that some of our, of our major reserves, such as Shushlui and Falozi Park and the Drakensberg um, World Heritage Site, 
they are becoming islands in a sea of transformation. We can then also map the amount of habitat loss over time and make predictions of how much habitat will be lost into the future. Just between 1994 and 2005, we lost an average of 1.2% of natural habitat per annum. Clearly, this is unsustainable and a great area of concern for biodiversity in the province. We can drill down and then look at the impact of habitat loss on our different biomes. Here we are showing grasslands in light green, shown in the western part of the province, and our savanna systems in the khaki colour. And we can see that grasslands have lost almost 50% of their habitat in this study period. We can then drill down into some of the smaller biomes and this dashed line is the Indian Ocean Coastal Belt which occurs in a narrow belt along the coast and we can see we've lost almost 75% of that biome type. Our wetlands and our savannas and our forests, I beg your pardon, by comparison have lost relatively less amounts of habitat. We can drill down even further and do a similar analysis of vegetation types in the province and we can see very clearly that our coastal areas are under the greatest threat followed by the midlands area where um, agriculture and timber plantations are prime. Let's have a look at some of the climate change impacts. We modelled using a whole lot of fl um, floristic plot data the correlations of environmental drivers to floristic composition and the three key variables are mean annual temperature, soil based status and mean annual precipitation. Now this is very important given climate change because all the climate change models predict that there will be changes in precipitation and temperature. Where the blue lines intersect, I have shown the average conditions in KZN currently and we have just under 840 mils of rain on average across the province and an average temperature of 18.2 degrees. We then modelled a suite, an ensemble of different climate models and we can see that all six climate models predict we will get much hotter between one and a half and two degrees which is really hot for an average increase by 2050. However, there was less congruence in the precipitation models with five of the models predicting that things would get drier and only one model predicting that things would get wetter. So if we just model the two extremes of these six models, we can then use these three key drivers of floristic composition and use an iterative k-means algorithm to identify environmental domains. Now you could think of this as the environmental stage on which your plants and animals are actors. So they will respond to climate change in their own way but if we understand how the stage or the environment is changing we have a better idea of how the species might respond. So we have 23 environmental domains modeled on soil based status, temperature and precipitation. So this is the current environmental domain and we can model how it's predicted to change in the hotter and drier conditions. And we can see that the red colored um, environmental domains expand southwards and westwards. The central area, lighter color beige domain, is almost entirely lost and replaced by a darker beige colored. It will ultimately become totally lost in the next few years afterwards and we will see the emergence of novel ecosystems. We can then model the wetter and hotter scenario and we can see a similar expansion. The purple areas expand down the south coast and we see some more of the green areas expanding. We can then plot climate stability on the x-axis versus habitat loss on the, on the y habitat on the y-axis and ideally you want to be in this top right quadrant. That's where you still have a lot of habitat remaining and the climate change is predicted to be the least. You don't want to be down in the red areas because that's where climate change impacts are expected to be the highest and you don't have a lot of habitat left. So that's a dangerous place to be. We can map out this vulnerability and we can see that our coastal areas are very vulnerable, our midlands areas and then very importantly our escarpment areas are coming out as important. So what are the solutions to loss of habitat and climate change? 
Well, landscape connectivity is an important tool for maintaining resilience to global change and obviously we need to increase the protected area state and limit further habitat loss. But let's just speak a little bit more about connectivity. How do we spatially prioritize the linkages in a landscape to build ecological resilience? Well, we know that resilience is enhanced by areas of high biodiversity, heterogeneous landscapes, and then the maintenance of disturbance regimes. So you must have your broad scale responses, your ecological and evolutionary processes must be able to function. Things like your dispersal, colonization, migration, fire, and pollination. So how do, we, how do we do this in GIS? Well, we use our land cover map to set baseline resistance values. So natural areas would have a low value, highly transformed areas would be high. We then spatially prioritize our linkages and we want to select for areas that have high beta diversity. This gives you a greater bang for your conservation buck. You want to make sure you include all your threatened plant species and communities and you also want to select for your more climatically stable areas. You can then discount the resistance values to come up with a final resistance value. And then you want to aim to develop your linkages aligned to the identified environmental gradients in the province. So these are the linkages that we developed. The gray areas are protected areas and the linkages between them. One can vary the resistance values and the width of the corridors. And then you can also identify which are the critical protected areas and linkages to maintain connectivity in the province going forward. And with that, thank you very much. I'd like to thank ESRI, Juniper GIS and the Society for Conservation GIS. Without their assistance, I would not have been able to do this. Hello everyone. I hope you are doing well. My name is Hermenegildo Matimel. I'm a Mozambican conservationist botanist based at the National Herbarium of Mozambique. As part of my role, I'm also head of the Southern African Plant Specialist Group under the Species Survival Commission of the ICN. And I'm currently a PhD candidate in biodiversity management at DICE, University of Kent in, in the UK. Shortly, I was fortunate in 2017 to be granted the SCGIS scholarship to attend the GIS training in the US. This was a remarkable experience, not just for the training opportunity, but for meeting people and networking. I can assure you that the, the group still in touch till now, as we have created a group WhatsApp to communicate. I would like therefore to um, express my sincere gratitude to my mentors, including Mervyn Lotter, John Barrows, Domitina Raimondo, Jonathan Temberlake. So these are people that have been coaching me for many, many years. Of course, now working with other people, so such as Bob Smith and David Roberts. I'm really grateful for them. Right, today we are going to talk about um, the process of identifying um, biodiversity and conservation priorities in, in Maputalan. So Maputalan it's an area that is within southern Mozambique, northeast KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, and eastern Iswatini. So this area um, is a subset of the Maputaland Pondoland Albany Global Biodiversity Hotspot, suggesting that its conservation um, has been many years ago recognized as of global importance. <coughs> And as you may be aware that uh, um, there is site-based um, priority approaches including KBAs and IPAs. So, so those are the most widely used site scale approaches that are based on identifying KBAs and IPAs. However, it's largely in test as whether um, the KBA and IPA approaches uh, produce consistent and similar results. Uh, and where the sites they identify represent broader biodiversity. So to those who may not be aware of IPAs, it's important plant areas, which is an initiative um, initiated by Plant Life uh, many years ago. And so what we're doing here, we are comparing the KBA and IPA approaches using the Maputa and Center of Plant Endemism in Southern Africa as a case study. <clears throat> 
So what you can see here is that um, the two sites here have already been identified as key biodiversity areas and a project led by WCS Mozambique using plant species. What we did here was to assess um, the two sites to see whether they qualify, they will qualify as IPAs as well. And in fact, they did. So through this process, we got to learn that in fact, the biggest challenge with IPAs and KBAs is related to the boundary delineation of the site. Yes, that's, that's really a challenge. So the delineation of the boundaries in this example followed strictly the IPA guidelines and KBA guidelines, which means, for example, uh, for sites enclosed by existing conservation areas, the delineation process followed the existing boundaries. So the, the Lequat Forest Reserve, as you can see there in green, um, that's an existing conservation area. And the process for delineating the boundary was just following the existing boundaries. But the, 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 the Matutrin site, which is uh, the area in brown, um, so the delineation was based on spatial distribution of trigger elements, trying to encompass the less degraded or transformed habitat based on screen digitalization using the breath pro imagery. Yes, doing so, it's great, but hardly repeatable. So what we <clears throat> try to do, so we are investigating um, a KBA and IPA delineation process that can capture a wider range of biological and environmental variation, and hopefully that that process can also be repeatable. So IPAs and KBAs, as you may know, um, highlight sites that are of global importance for biodiversity, and it follows that they may then be used to inform expansion of conservation area networks on the ground or to establish new areas for conservation. So in this study, their delineation was trialed on the basis of the ecological requirements of their trigger elements. So the boundary delineation was achieved through modeling the distribution of the suitable habitat of the trigger elements. So this process took into consideration the key information such as species spatial data, ecological zones, digital elevation models, uh, soil information, and, and land cover. And you can see uh, that the required forest reserve, which is the um, the area to the to the south here in red, um, the southern moss of that area uh, presents a higher level of biological and environmental uh, variation, suggesting that uh, there's a lot that may have been missed out uh, through the idea of just trying to follow the existing boundaries of a uh, protected area and, and, and so on. So <clears throat> we also tried another approach, um, which is segmentation. Segmentation is a key component of the object-based classification workflow. So this process groups neighboring peak cells together that are similar in color and have certain shape characteristics. So for the segmentation process, various combinations of settings and the way things were applied and the results were assessed visually until the outcome appeared to be optimal for the purpose and scale of analysis. So for example, planning units that were smaller than 10 hectares were dissolved into a um, planning unit with which they shared the greatest common boundary. Um, so in overall take-home take message uh, for this IP and KBA uh, process is that the findings suggest that the two methodologies, KBA and IPA, are aligned in that they select similar sites, but they both tend to select sites containing the same set of species and so fail to highlight other important biological elements. I have to say that this uh, study is not finished, so this is an ongoing um, uh, trial, so we, we, we will still come up uh, with new uh, suggestions, new findings as, as the start uh, moves on. But what we think is that uh, the way forward um, um, will be special planning. Right? Uh, in, so in light of the GSPC in the post-2020 biodiversity framework, 
um, suggests that by 2030, at least 15% of each ecological region and 75% of areas important for plant diversity are identified and protected. So having identified the KBAs and IPAs, um, as you saw before, the next step was to apply smart conservation um, planning to highlight areas that if we're conserved will benefit the most biodiversity. So the, 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 the map to the left is just showing uh, the, the, the planning units under different categories. And uh, the map to the right is just showing the um, representative score based on meeting targets for land cover types and species. So this will then inform the potential proposed conservation landscape for, for Maputo land. But as I said, this is um, really, really very, very uh, preliminary. Um, um, uh, I had preliminary outputs, so the, this was just uh, prepared for the purpose of the talk and showing that we are we're using GIS for conservation purpose. So the targets here um, are, are not. Uh, um, we're not well set, so they we're still on the process of setting targets and so on. So I will keep you updated. I'd like to express my sincere gratitude uh, to the Royal Botanic Gardens Q for funding my uh, my PhD, and also I'm grateful to collaborative projects, particularly Darwin Initiative, uh, TPAS Mozambique, KBS Mozambique, and thank my supervisors, Bob Smith, David Roberts, and Ian Dabishu, and say thank you to the SCGIS uh, for this opportunity. Good morning. Thanks for having me. I am Anastasia Makati from Botswana. I work for the Ogavango Research Institute, ORI, at the University of Botswana. ORI is dedicated to the study and conservation of one of the world's largest, unique, and most intact inland wetland ecosystem and world heritage site, the Wakavango Delta, and surrounding ecological systems. As a GIS technician, I provide technical support to ORI graduate students and academic staff. I also extend the services to other external researchers, government departments, businesses, and the community. I am a 2020-2021 SCGIS Scholar recipient, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. In today's presentation, I will talk about how I use forest-based classification in ArcGIS Pro to predict unknown riparian vegetation communities, one of the many skills I learned through the scholarship program. This is my outline. First, I will define what riparian vegetation are, the role, and characteristics. I'll move on to threats. I'll then talk about need for research. I'll move on to aim, methodology, my results, and then I'll conclude. Riparian vegetation communities are a transition zone between terrestrial and aquatic systems. They are important because they play a significant role due to their provision of ecosystem services and products to both human and animal population. Ecosystem services performed by riparian tree species include, include primary production, which produces food, nutrients, and water purification through the process of evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration by riparian tree species lowers the water table. This creates a gradient which facilitates continuous movement of water from swamps to islands. Globally, Riparian species are threatened by loss due to deforestation for agriculture. A research by a report by uh, Natural Resources and People, which was published in 2007, revealed the increase have revealed an increase in African elephant that destroy the trees, which leads to degradation. Other threats emanate from invasive species replacing native native ones. So, some species from uh, riparian vegetation communities can be used to make dugout canoes, and the canoe is used as, as a mo mode of transport for tourists by local communities 
which improve their livelihoods. As you can see on the picture on the left, they, these three communities can also be, be used. Uh, they are also used for thatching traditional houses. As you can see, this is an example of thatches collected from one riparian community. Documented studies of the Okabango uh, Delta features are limited, and due to lack of baseline data, some of the features of the Okabango Delta have been subject to rough estimation. Various authors have studied riparian vegetation in the Okavango Delta. Sebuing et al. 2004 have classified and described the population size structure of woody vegetation. Green Rose 2003 investigated riparian vegetation and the role of medium resolution products such as Lancet ETM in characterizing riparian vegetation as a means to measure evapotranspiration. Rambeck studied uh, uh, species diversity. Ellery et al. 1993 quantify the spatial characteristics. I have to say that neither of these studies have have not have have utilized machine learning algorithms in ArcGIS Pro to to map or predict riparian woodland. So, in order for us to conserve, in order for us to conserve riparian vegetation, we we need to start by establishing its current status, either in terms of species composition, distribution, or population structure analysis. The aim of my study was to map and predict potential riparian woodland uh, species using, using machine learning tools in ArcGIS Pro. So, the study was conducted in Saronga, which is in the eastern panhandle of the Wokavango Delta. The Wokavango Delta is fed by uh, local rainfall and seasonal floods from the Angolan highlands. Local rainfall in the delta is out of phase with seasonal floods. I also have to mention why I selected this area. I selected this study site because of several reasons. One of them is that riparian vegetation communities in the delta as a whole is currently threatened by among other things, uh, climate change. This is a study which was carried by Mike Mar Hudson and published in 2011. And there's also high risk of overexploitation of woodland resources, such as uh, deforestation, where people cut down trees for firewood and construction. So, the forest-based um, classification regression tool trains a model based on known uh, values provided as part of training, provided as part of training a uh, training data set. In this case, I've provided the model with uh, riparian vegetation uh, data. So my study has followed a simplified six-step modeling process, whereby I prepared the data, I trained the data, I evaluated the model performance. I trained the data with different parameters. I compared my results, and then I had to redo it uh, more than once until I was uh, uh, okay with what I saw. And one other thing is that I, ha I have to mention that the forest-based classification has got three uh, prediction types. There is the train only, which helps the analyst to actually assess the accuracy of, of the model like when using all those variables, the train only will help you to actually assess the accuracy of the, the variables if we, if we included. And then there is the, the predict to features. There is also the predict to raster. These two steps are actually done after you've done the train only, which is what, this, uh, which, which is what my study has done initially. And the tool can be found under the analysis tab when they do processing tools in ArcGIS Pro. So I've provided raster, raster's ex explanatory variables for, for the model, but there was a, a river layer which I, I converted into raster by using the distance accumulation tool. And 
I've also included vegetation indices, and this include the NDVI, the SAVI, the, 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 the digital elevation model, and the GUI image. The GUI image had four bands, band one, two, three, and four, and the four was the linear infrared band. So, uh, my preliminary results include model diagnostic to see if the model was actually uh, was uh, was accurate based on the train only prediction type. One of the diagnostic that comes out is the variable importance. This helps an analyst to to see how well does each explanatory variable do its splitting in the trees. So my results have shown that distance accumulation to rivers spectral indices and uh, the near infrared band were ranked higher than other explanatory variables. Another diagnostic which was done was the model out of bag. This one helps how well can each tree predict the excluded features. In my case, I only get 4.2% uh, explained by the model. The last one was that of the, the last one was that of the model val validation. This one helps how well can the forest predict the features not used in the training. By default, the model holds back 10% of the data. But in my case, I only held back 5%, mainly because my data set was very small and I just couldn't use most of it. And um, my, 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 my regression showed an accuracy of 67%, which was not really, really bad. So further analysis. I was meant to actually predict Chorasta to get those unknown riparian vegetation communities. Unfortunately, I couldn't get to that stage because I encountered errors, which I'm still fixing, and I'm hoping to actually share my results once, once I've, uh, I've, I've gotten to that stage. In conclusion, I would, uh, I will just conclude that my, the model works better with vegetation indices, digital elevation model, and distance accumulation to, to rivers. I would like to thank the Society for Conservation GIS for giving me the opportunity to actually learn all these technical skills. The, my employer, the Okavango Research Institute. Thank you, Debbie, Herman, and Anastasia for sharing your inspiring work with the audience, with wisdom that you've gained through the SCGI Scholar Program. Really heartwarming indeed. And it's so amazing to see how you utilize the ESRI technology with such expertise. Um, I would now like to invite our presenters back live on camera, Craig, as well as Mervyn, for the live Q&A. As you can see, I have uh, Lauren Sweden that is going to assist me with the Q&A. Okay, so let's start. Um, Mervyn and Craig, these are your young scholars, um, definitely young. May you kindly <laughs> advise or comment on their actual presentations? I mean, I can jump in that. I mean, yeah, we, as I said, we got quite a... Uh, uh, we receive many applications. We go through quite a rigorous uh, review process, and I must say we're very happy. I mean, all the scholars are doing fantastic work. I mean, they they build up such a. I think Jolda referred to it. They build up this um, like social bond. They may, they remain in touch with one another and the organisation for many years, and they're doing all the continually good work back home. And I like to say that there's quite a few other scholars participating in this webinar today, uh, not presenting their work, but they've done also very similar and, and, and great work. So I just want to say well done to them all. Uh, thanks, Marvin. Uh, Laura, we have a question on an anonymous attendee. Um, okay, so do you want to read that out? Okay, so I think this question, um, Debbie, is for you. It says, hi Debbie, can your modeling work be shared and scaled to other provinces and neighboring countries? Hi there, great question and yes it can. So we've tried to work those linkages on basic principles. So where would resilience in the landscape be highest? It's the areas of high beta diversity, high turnover of diversity in the landscape, 
areas where it's modeled that climate change would be the least. So if one is applying the principles of resilience, then I don't see why it shouldn't work anywhere else in the world for that matter. So it, it's just to select areas and build in resilience into your conservation plan. Um, these products would feed into a conservation plan. So definitely. Um, we also, we have another question. Um, it's by Mutukusi. Apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. The question is, hello, Anastasia. How did you optimize your hyperparameters, which is the trees and depth for the forest model? Would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, yes, please. How did you optimize your hyperparameters, which is trees and depth for the forest model? Oh, thank you for that question. Uh, the short answer to that was that uh, from the communities that I, uh, I had collected on the field, I, before I, I ran the forest uh, classification tool, all I had to do was to group the different uh, tree species into communities A, B, C, and D. And then I, I fitted the model with that, with that, uh, with that variable. So I didn't have to look at trees and depth and all that. Fantastic. But maybe, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. If I, I can. Have another question. Mervyn, would you like to add on to that? Uh, I can. So, I mean, so um, Anastasia used the uh, uh, forest based regression and prediction tool in ArcGIS Pro, and it has a number of default settings. So it'll be 100 trees. Um, so, that, uh, as far as I know, that uh, Israel spent a lot of work and time trying to look at, let's say, a default set of, of settings. And um, yeah, you can change them if you like, but as I think Anastasia just used the default settings. So there wasn't changing the number of trees and the like. So she just um, explored um, the, the subset sampling as to how many records you hold back and then you look at the results and looking at the impact of the different input variables, but not so much on the actual settings of the model. Great. You know, what's amazing to see is that Mervyn, you know, as the mentor of Anastasia, you're quite, you know, into the entire project with her. And that's like holding her hand through the whole, uh, you know, uh, conservation solution. And I think that's one of the fundamental things about joining the SCGIS scholarship program is that we have mentors like you and Craig to inspire those scholars. And if I can add this, so what happened with Anastasia was our, our scholar from 2000. Um, but unfortunately, that year, because of COVID, we couldn't meet. And then this current year, we invited those same scholars back and they received the virtual training. And then SCGIS also has their user con their, their training in the cinema in California every year, but because of COVID, they couldn't. So Anastasia presented her research um, virtually. And so we were able to also assist her before that. And um, we try and encourage with each, you know, each year when the scholars come to the States to they have a research project they present um, at the ESRI user conference and the SCGIS conference. And we try and sit with them and spend quite a lot of time uh, supporting them in their project development. And if there's anything that we can help or maybe just reach out to others to help them. So yeah, it is a process and it is a, a relationship really. It's a fantastic process. Okay, um, thanks Mervyn. Um, so Debbie, just another question actually for you. Um, and this is from Peter from MAPS. Could you perhaps share the last publication you referred to in your talk, selecting the priority areas for conservation? So it's not really a question. I think Peter's just asking you to, to share um, the link. Or oh, not a problem. Yes, can, I just, can I just jump in there? Um, just on a different note, um, just for some clarity. So for the viewers that I wear two hats, so I'm fortunate to have a day job where I'm work for the Wipumalanga Tourism and Parks Agency as the biodiversity plan and JS manager. But I was a scholar myself 10 years ago, 2011. And um, I learned so much from through that opportunity that I have been um, yeah, supporting them since 2014 on the board and part of the uh, international committee. So that's a re I really volunteer my time for them um, because of the uh, let's say amazing impact that they've had on my life that's what I can do to give back to it so just that's why you'll see me twice today yeah and then later on as the NTPA. Thank you Marvin. Um, so we don't have any more questions. Um, Craig, would like Craig would like to, Craig would you like to say something? 
Yes, please. Uh, thank you. And um, yeah, just to everybody who presented, it's just fantastic to see this work. And 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 what's what's more impressive is to see so much science backing the work that's been done. So fantastic. And, and I think I have a question for all students. And I mean, the wonderful work that Esri support conservationists with the with the software is. We know that's all well and good, but um, we know availability of data is sometimes, you know, tricky. Um, I'd like to ask all the scholars as to, you know, how, how easy was it to source data and information um, for your studies and for your work? Um, and was it readily shared with you as a conservationist? Um, so, yeah, to anybody who's willing to answer, or all three of you, perhaps. Let's have a start with Harman. He's been very quiet. Yes, so thank you for that. Um, of course, uh, being a botanist uh, with main focus on plants, it's really, really difficult to have information. But of course, um, Mozambique, as you know, have gone through several stages till today. You know, after the independence, we went through a civil war for many, many years. After that, um, you could not do field work because there were several landmines in the field. But um, through several um, work and collaboration with different institutions in the region and internationally, uh, we managed to have uh, information and several projects have come for the last 15 years uh, doing a lot of field work. So I had data from my own herbarium in Mozambique, but also I had um, information from regional herbarium, including Satafta, Isotin, and also uh, from the Royal Blood Gardens too, where they have a lot of information from the region. And we had uh, collaborative projects. So I had that date. Uh, and I also did um, field work. Uh, I had a lot of support from Enzabel of KZN, working closely with Adrian M. Strong and David uh, and, and, um, and Boyd, uh, because the smart conservation planning component, uh, it includes all the uh, the data for all species, fauna and flora. So um, Enzavel Kazadan has been a key player uh, for that and also helping with field work uh, throughout the Maputa land. Uh, so, so I covered the three countries, Mozambique, Iswatin, and, and, and uh, South Africa in 2019 to 2020, just before uh, the pandemic uh, came. So I was fortunate to be able to go to the field and get as much I, I could. Of course, I had planned to go back again, but I can't do field work anymore. I just have to work with what I have. So that's how um, I managed to have the information from um, the, the information that I'm using for my study. Fantastic. Anastasia, Debbie, would you both would like to answer as well? Okay, Debbie, yeah, sure. I'd, I'd like to, to echo um, the lack of plant data and um, that that can be quite an issue and I did a lot of work collating other studies that had been done but things are really changing and data has been made available globally now on these online databases like BGIF, um, all the baseline data that you can get directly through ESRI um, so it's becoming easier and easier to get data. And then of course, if you simply can't get data, then one can go back and, and use surrogates instead of that. So you need to get a little bit creative if, if data is still missing. But with all the wonderful online, and um, Mervyn, help me here, there is, um, ESRI has provided Africa data so there is a source for that. I, I forget exactly where one finds it, but there is a portal for a source of Africa data as yeah, well. There's a geo portal. There's yeah, a geo portal okay. for Africa. Yeah, we, we will share the links after uh, the, the session. But also, what's also great is that uh, with the access to ArcGIS Online, you also have uh, available uh, data with our Living Atlas. So that's great as well for looking at plant data. Um, so, Anastasia, would you like to also maybe comment on Craig's question? What was the question? Sorry. And how difficult or easy was it for you to collect data for your project? Oh, um, for me, 
to be honest, it wasn't difficult. It's just that um, when, because I got the sponsorship from the, the university I was schooling at the time, but uh, I feel like I, I, I could have had a lot of uh, uh, vegeta but apparent vegetation community uh, plots, like a lot of them, because it looks like uh, with machine learning uh, techniques, you need a lot of data to actually make the tool run very well. So one of the things I'm thinking is that I'll, I'll, I'll then, the other scholars here where I work who have uh, already collected data on riparian vegetation. So I'll try to actually uh, increase my, da my data set such that uh, I'll feed the tool with the, you know, the good amount of data and see if I'll be able to, to, to go to the next uh, steps of prediction because I really want to see those unknown uh, riparian vegetation communities where they can be found in the Okabango Delta for conservation purposes. Thank you, Anastasia. I think we have our last question, Lauren. Um, okay, that, uh, this looks like it's for Craig or Mervyn. Um, how can one learn about the SCGA scholarship and its requirements? I'll jump in there. So, um, yeah, it's open. I mean, we're not. There's no very strict criteria other than if you need to be, if you're in the USA, you probably stand a very small chance. The idea is really to support um, people who provide them with opportunity um, where they may not easily have access to good judge training or the ESU user conference or the ESU judge conference. Um, so what we have is that uh, if you can email me, I can then um, I coordinate the scholarship program where I can send out the announcements and then you'll get an application form that you need to complete. Um, we do consider diversity, uh, equity and equality in the, in the, in the review process. And um, we, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's an easy process and we're not very strict in terms of you need to be a certain age or qualification level or, or career. Um, we'll just assess that when we do the form. And um, yeah, my advice is do spend a lot of time completing the form. Don't do a rush job because we read a lot between the lines, if you know what I mean, when you complete the form. So just tell us heartfelt how you feel about um, the different questions and that will give us more insight into the applicants and you'll stand a better chance. Cool. Thank you, Melvin. Thank you, uh, scholars, for that beautiful presentation. Please keep doing the great work that you are doing. Um, now it's all fun and games with Lauren Sweden. <laughs> My favorite part of the event. Okay. Thanks, V. Um, before we break for our first session, we are going to have a fun GIS Day quiz. Um, it's time to test your um, conservation knowledge. We have five individual ArcGIS for personal use licenses up for grabs. So it's going to be fastest fingers first. Um, we've got seven questions and we are posting a link in the, for the quiz in the chat and the Q&A function boxes. So just click on the link. Answer the questions, um, hit submit. You've obviously got to put in your name and your email address. The first five correct entries will win. Um, and we will announce this at the end of our second session. So um, during the second session, I'll collate all the answers, check the winners, um, and we'll announce that right at the end. So have fun and good luck. Um, it is now six minutes past 11 South African time. I think if everybody could be back at 20 past 11, so that is in 14 minutes time, and we'll convene for our second session. Okay, thanks everybody. Welcome back everyone and welcome to session two. I would like to wish you all a very happy GIS day. Let's have a quick look into our session two agenda. First up, we have our keynote speaker, followed by a Q&A. There afterwards, we have a conservation offering presentation by myself that will lead us to four inspiring user stories from Southern Africa. Uh, there afterwards, I'll be joined by Lauren to assist me with the live Q&A. And once again, I would kind of like for you to kind of use the Q&A function that is available on Zoom. Should you have any questions or comments, uh, you can use this throughout the presentation and we will basically facilitate this at the end of the session. So let's start with session two's program. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Alice von Mullen, Research Manager at Mammal Research Institute, Whale Unit Department at the University of Pretoria. 
That's actually a mouthful. <laughs> Dr. Els will share the critical research on the body conditions and behavior patterns of the southern right whales. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Els. Thank you, thank you. I will share my screen quickly. There we go. Can you all see this PowerPoint? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Well, good day, everybody, and happy PIS Day. Um, so, as just introduced, I will speak to you a little bit about our right whale research that we have been conducting in the past few decades. So, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to right whales. Um, so, southern right whales breed of the South African coast uh, every winter, and so they make annual migrations where they breed at low latitudes um, on the coast of southern Africa, but also South America, Australia, and New Zealand. And they breed, uh, they feed at higher latitudes, so they migrate to the subantarctic regions where they will feed. They are very philopatric, which means they have a form of site fidelity to the breeding and the feeding grounds. And this gives rise to a stuck structure, so which means that the population of southern right whales of southern Africa, South America, and Australia, New Zealand are relatively separated. So a very important aspect to understand about the species in, in this specific talk is that right whales are capital breeders, which means that they feed one time of year and they breed another time of year. And I know I've got the picture up there as a penguin. A penguin is also usually a capital breeder. Um, and this means that their feeding success highly uh, influences their breeding success. And this is a very critical um, part of this presentation today. Also, they are case selected species, just like as humans, which means that they have a long lifespan, they have a slow reproduction, they have a high maternal investment and a high rate of calf survival usually. And again, this high maternal investment is going to be a critical aspect throughout the talk that I'm giving today. Um, the right whale was named the right whale by the whalers um, back in the day because they are slow swimmers, they are predictable in their coastal presence, they float when they're killed, and they have a high blubber content, which means that whalers could get a high amount of oil from these animals. And this created that the animals were the right whales to hunt. Especially also around the Cape, right whales were hunted notoriously. Um, because populations of Southern Africa, but also those from Namibia and Madagascar um, would migrate past the South African coast. And so South Africa had a, quite an extensive whaling history. And here you can see a little bit of the population declines because of whaling. So the late 1700s, it was estimated that there were between 60,000 and 100,000 right whales globally. And you can see how that population drops quite extremely around 1830 when a lot of whales were hunted, down to the minimum in 1920 when it was estimated to have about 60 reproducing females left globally. So this population was at the brink of extinction and gained international protection in 1935 from commercial whaling, after which the population started to increase again. And you can see here this little dent again in the population growth rate is um, shown more in detail on the top graph. And this is illegal Soviet catches. So the Soviet Union, who illegally killed about 3,000 right whales in the southern hemisphere, made this population crash again. But subsequently, right whales are protected from commercial whaling and their populations are increasing quite steadily. And it's actually a bit of a, a conservation success story in that way. And so when the population started to recover, um, it was very important to assess and monitoring this population recovery, as it is critical to the understanding of the impact of the massive removal of whales, but also of their recovery on the marine ecosystems. And so the whale unit has been monitoring the South African right whale population since 1969. Uh, this was immediately post the Soviet whaling. And this was initiated by the late Professor Peter Best. He actually initiated the research working for the government. And in 1985, he um, founded the whale unit at the University of Pretoria and took along all the data. So we can count now on about a 52 year data set. Since 1979 then, the surveys have been done with helicopter, as you can see in the images. And we take photographs of all the females with 
calves. This is now among the longest data sets in the world or any marine mammal. And as I get a little bit more about the data that we use in our research, obviously, it was quite interesting maybe to mention that obviously there were no TPSs back in the day when they started these surveys. So they used longitudinal bins of about 20 minutes to look at the distribution of these whales. And we actually still use these bins for certain analyses. And you can see on this graph that um, the areas between bin C, which is the Walker Bay area, and bin H, which is San Sebastian Bay, are the main concentration area for females with calves. So this is the main breeding ground of the South African right whale population. And I've also circled uh, to the right, the bins Q to X. Those are actually the ones where we do not see right whales. So that's why we stopped surveying that area because the cost obviously of these aerial surveys doesn't justify the lack of sightings. Um, we then also look at a general westward shift. And again, it's one of those reasons why we keep using those bins is to see how these animals as the population increases, reoccupy the South African breeding ground. And we can see in the top left corner is the first decade of the research. You see the majority of females with calves are in the hook area. And this is gradually expanding. You see that on the bottom left is the second decade you see the gradual expense towards the left and the right, which is San Sebastian Bay and the Agullas area. And then on the top right, you see the, the other next decade. And you can see how the areas between Walker Bay and Strasbourg, Agullas area, are increasing. And even this last decade, we can see that in Walker Bay, we have as many females with calves usually than we have in the area of the home. So this kind of just shows how we use these longitudinal bins in our research today. But we also obviously put dots on a map. This is a map of an aerial survey, I think of 2019, where you can see again, the red circles are the females with calves. You see again, that main concentration between Hermanus basically and Witsant um, with the, the densities in the Hop and Walker Bay. Besides looking at just their distribution, we also do photo identification. So that's why we photograph all the females with calves and also individuals with a brindle coloration. And up to 2005, the matching of these photo identification pictures was done manually. And I've shown you a picture here, how Peter Best used to do this visually uh, with photographs that he would print out and match them visually. Thank God for me, today we do this all automatically with digital photography and an automatic photo, uh, photo identification software which helps me to categorize these animals and classify them as new individuals or as a reciting of an individual we know. And I say thankfully, because we have now over 2,300 animals in our catalog. This is the National Southern Right World Catalog. And there are about 1,800 reproducing females in this catalog. And so about 70% of the adult females we see on any given year are recaptures or are animals that we have seen before. The other 30% adults believe to be um, new mothers, basically, so that the young mothers that are entering into the catalog. And so when you look at the combination of photo ID and the distribution, we have some also some interesting results. So on the top left graph, you can see how the, the proportion of experienced calves, so these are cows that have had two or more calves is higher in certain areas. This means that a female that has a bit of experience uh, and has been a mother before will choose the areas um, to, the, to the west, so uh, that area again between Walker Bay and San Sebastian Bay, and not so much the eastern bins as we call them, which is, for example, the area of Plettenberg Bay. On the bottom graph, you can also see another result that um, shows, for example, how cows that are photographed in the bins C to H, so that area again between Walker Bay and the Hook, are more likely to be re-photographed in the same bin in subsequent years. This means to us that right whales that have been in this area will choose to become there again. And this is basically due to the environmental factors that are ideal in these areas, in these bays. So it's about gentle slopes, um, warm waters, um, lack of currents, and a lack of predators. So based on the photo identification, we also look at very critical population parameters. And I'll show you some results here. I think I'm missing a graph here, because this was a graph that's supposed to show a population increase rate of about 7% per year. 
uh, since um, since the start of the monitoring. And we can also see like the year calving interval. So usually right whales will calve every three years after one year of gestation, one year of lactation, and then the female needs one year of rest before she falls pregnant again. And I can see on this graph, you see a second peak on six years, which is basically a female that will have had two, three year intervals. So we missed her maybe on one survey. And so we see her three years later. So she'll give us a six year interval. And you see another small peak at nine. So these are just um, repetitive three year calving intervals. Oh, sorry, here's my graph of the population. So you can see how it started quite low in the 1970s and it starts to increase quite steadily. Um, throughout time. And 7% per year is basically the maximum biologically possible for the species due to the slow reproduction. However, we have seen changing trends in the last decade, more or less. So we see that the calving intervals since after the time has decreased. So the, the frequency, I mean, of three year calving intervals is decreasing over time. And the frequency of these four year calving intervals and even five years is increasing. And this basically means that there is some reproductive failure going on. So a four-year cycle would basically mean that the female or fails to conceive and needs two years of feeding and recovering before she can fall pregnant again. Or that she does fall pregnant but has a death of a fetus very early in pregnancy. A five-year interval at the other side is caused by other two other scenarios, or the female falls pregnant and has a miscarriage late in pregnancy, or she gives birth to a calf, but the calf dies very soon after birth, after which the female will just recover a year and fall pregnant the next year. So these four and five year cycles are basically showing us that these females in the population are struggling to reproduce at normal three year intervals. And this is a graph that shows us the calving success of the population. And again, you can see a drastic drop since 2009, with a peak again in 2018 up to normal levels, and again, a very drastic drop after that. And because of this uh, increase in calving intervals, we see a slowing down of the population growth rate slightly. And also we see uh, alterations in the migration patterns. And this is shown on the graph here. So the orange graph is basically the, the adult whales that have no calves. So it could be males, but they could also be females that have no calf in that specific year. And you can see that their presence on the South African coast has drastically dropped again since 2009. On the blue graph, you can see the number of females with calves that we count on our aerial survey. And you can see a drastic drop in since 2015, a peak again in 2018, and again, very drastic drops after that. So this migration pattern is obviously altered. We also see a faster westward coastal shift, which indicates to us that there might be reduced residency time on the South African breeding ground. As I spoke to you about um, the fact that right whales are capital breeders, this just means that the breeding success is mediated through the feeding success. So if we see calving failure, does this mean that there are poor feeding conditions for these whales? And although extremely well studied on their breeding grounds, there's actually very poor knowledge on the foraging ecology of the species. So that's why we're currently working on uh, various projects related to this working hypothesis that the whales are being affected by poor feeding conditions. So we're trying to test these hypotheses by evaluating different things. So we're looking at the feeding ecology of the species in general. We're looking at identifying the contemporary feeding grounds. So where are these animals feeding at the moment? Are, these, uh, are there environmental conditions that have changed in these feeding grounds? And has the body conditions of these animals changed over time? So I'm going to quickly give you a bit of uh, results that we've had so far. So to answer some of these questions, we need to take biopsy samples, as you can see here on the picture. So we shoot a little arrow to the whale and we can get a little piece of skin and blubber, which we use for analyses. And the most important analyses in terms of foraging ecology is related to stable isotopes. I won't go into detail on how these work, but stable isotopes in the skin can basically tell the story on where the animals have fed and where and on what in the past few months. And we did a comparison of samples that were taken in the 1990s 
and those in the 2010s. And we see a complete shift in diet, and we also see a northward shift in feeding location. But to put it on a map, very simple for you, it means that we're believing that the area C that you see there on the map is being less used by these whales and that they're foraging more north of the polar front. The question then in terms of diet shift is that if they've changed krill for copepods, which is likely less nutritionist, but that is something we still don't know. So in general, I spoke to you about these animals being philopatric, so they have a natal philopatry, which means that they find suitable foraging grounds based on what they've learned from their mothers, the migration they've, they've been shown. But this can form possibilities for an ecological trap. If, if, if an animal will just migrate towards the areas that he knows and these areas are not optimal, this will cause an ecological trap. But as we see in our isotope data, there is some form of individual innovation because we do see a shift in foraging location and diet. So this shows us that there is some initiation of adaptive behavior, but at the same time, we're still seeing the reproductive failure. So we're asking the question if this adaptive behavior is enough. Another thing we've been assessing is the body condition of the whales to see how their nutritional status is. And we've compared contemporary data to historical data from 1988 to 1989. We use the same methodology and we've compared the body condition and we see that there's a 24% decrease in body condition of our southern right whales, at least the lactating females between the 88 to 89 and 2019. Sorry, I wanted to also say we've put this also in a global perspective and we've compared the South African body condition data with those um, from Argentinian and Australian breeding grounds. And we see that the South African right whales are significantly more skinny than the Australian and the South American right whales. Another important uh, aspect of our research is trying to find the foraging uh, sites of these animals. So where are they actually feeding? And for that, we're using satellite telemetry. So this year, for the first time um, since 2001, we've put on satellite transmitters on four animals this year, and we hope to put some uh, more on next year to look at their foraging location. And this is actually a nearly live location. I put this map on yesterday. Um, so you can follow them on our website uh, in real time. Uh, and so these animals for now are not going further than the 43 degrees south. And, and this is quite notorious. As you can see in a map from 2001, these animals migrated quite quickly past the 50 degrees south. So we're quite curious how these animals are gonna move. Uh, and if that northward shift in foraging location that we see with the stable isotope is gonna show also in the migration pattern. And obviously, if we look at food availability, we need to look at the role of climate in all of this. And that means we need to take into account this extremely complex chain of reaction. So if we look at the southern right whale prevalence on the South African coast, we, we, we think about obviously the calving success and migration, and that is influenced by the physiology of these whales, so basically energy and body condition. Now that in turn is going to be influenced by the productivity of their feeding grounds, so the phytoplankton and zooplankton, which in turn is again influenced by the physical oceanography, like sea ice currents, etc., which in turn is again influenced by the climate variability. So this is an enorm enormously complex model that we're trying to unravel. And because we have in South Africa a bit of a lack of that zooplankton data in, contemporary, in the feeding areas, we quite need to sh a jump actually a step from the body condition and energy, so the physiology of the whales, towards the physical oceanography. And that makes it extremely complex. So the big challenges for us remain to identify these contemporary feeding grounds. So it means we need to build habitat models of these feeding grounds, which um, we do obviously with the stable isotope work and the telemetry work, which we hope to increase substantially in the next couple of years. Again, this challenge of this lack of long-term zooplankton data in our area of interest makes it even more complex. And also obviously, population is increasing. We need to not is the possibility of a density dependence effect of an effect of a population coming to a certain level where the environment can sustain it. Now, interestingly, what we see in the South African breeding ground uh, is being seen also in the other feeding areas. Uh, I'm sorry, breeding grounds like the Argentinian and Australian New Zealand. 
And so we're looking at a global collaborative research project at the moment under the IWC, so the International Whaling Commission, uh, where we use actually the right whale as the right sentinel, as an indicator of the effect of climate variability on the Southern Ocean productivity. So again, to, to close down this, this, this chat, it's, you know, the right whales are a very clear example of a success story in conservation. After their protection from commercial whaling, the population increases quite steadily, but we not need to lose sight of the fact that they're now faced with new factors that are influencing their recovery. And this in itself makes it very clear how critical it is for this long-term monitoring so that we can put it all into perspective on a large time scale. Thank you very much. I have written down the website of the Mammal Research Institute. Uh, and again, you, if you can log into there, you can follow these whales we've tagged this year in real time. Um, and so you can join me with, with our quest of where they're going. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alt, for that stunning presentation. I can see your passion and love for whales. I would like to ask you, um, maybe on a personal note, where did your love and passion of whales start off? I was born with it, I think. I guess as a little child, I was only thinking about working with whales. <laughs> okay, great. So the one question I would like to also ask is, uh, I'm sure, you know, in your presentation, you mentioned GPS uh, locators with the whales. Uh, how difficult is this process? Sorry, say that again. How difficult is what process? Sorry. The, the process of geotagging the whales. It's very, very complicated. So there's only about five taggers in the world. So people that are very experienced with putting satellite tags on whales. Um, so the process is very delicate, obviously, for the welfare of the animal, uh, as not, you know, losing the tag is obviously, if, if we miss, we lose the tag. So it's a very complicated process. If we take one tag out on a full day of, of boat work, we're happy. <laughs> Absolutely. So obviously you, or you would put into uh, you know, your agenda when it comes to tagging that you don't tag during breeding season. Is this, is this also thought about? Or is there a selection? We do tag breeding? during, it's the only time of year we can tag. And because the, the females with calves are so critical to the population, we actually need to know where they are feeding. So we do tag uh, principally mothers. Yeah. So if you need a tag, I'm available to assist you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> so we do have some questions in the chat for you, Dr. Alt. Okay. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna mm -hmm. run through them. I'm just gonna go into our Q and A, and we have Natalie Ray Jones. Our first question: What will be the impact of the proposed seismic seismic survey by Shell of the Wild Coast plant over five months from first December? Yes, I get seismic a lot. Before we start. Seismic. Seismic. seismic, that's oil and gas exploration. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. yes. So, yeah, so the area where they're proposing it is, is not necessarily within right whale distribution at that time of year. Um, so they're starting December, uh, which usually the right whales are or on the west coast or further south. Um, so in, in that way, I'm, I'm at least relieved they didn't plan it during whale season in that way. Um, because, yeah, I mean, obviously, seismic explorations will have effects on the right whales um, in terms of, of behavioral changes, I can imagine. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Alts. Uh, do we have any more questions, Lauren? Um, there's just one in the chat from Carmen um, to ask Dr. Alts, is the body condition scoring methodology available? Yes, I mean, I'm happy to chat and, and, and share the, the way we do it, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and I know uh, Mervyn was also asking a very similar question to the previous one, that is it possible that the underwater exploration for gas or oil could be having an impact on the whales? Um, could this be, you know, could this account for the lower numbers of right whales in the Mossel Bay area? So, yeah, I mean, in, in the first question, will it have an impact on whale seismic surveys in general? You would say yes, obviously. Um, again, this specific um, shell, Exploration is planned in December, um, where I'm, I'm quite confident there wouldn't be any right whales necessarily in the area due to their normal migration patterns. So in that way, I'm not, I'm not inclined to, to think that that is in part um, a reason why there would be less whales in Mossel Bay, um, not in that time of year. 
Okay, so you also mentioned that aerial photography is very expensive. Um, are you using mm -hmm. drone technology to photograph these right whales? Um, so we use drone technology for the body conditions. So um, that is that is the main reason. And we also obviously can then photo ID the animals we work with. But to do the aerial survey between Nature's Valley and Musenberg, the drone technology is actually not at the speed for us to do this. So we must imagine that in the area of the hub, we'd have a concentration of about 100 females with um, no cliffs. So it's, it's a long, slopey beach um, with the battery life of about a half hour. It's going to be impossible for us to go and photograph. So that's why we need to use helicopters. The helicopter allows us to hover above a whale and photograph it and then move over to the next whale. Even, even fixed wing planes in that time um, is going to be fairly impossible. Thank you. If you need any assistance to jump on the helicopter, I'm available. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Els, for that great presentation and answering those q and I've always, I'm also, I also learned something new as well. Um, I think I would, before we end off this, I would like to add that the MRI rail unit will be presenting their findings of their, at their research second drone user conference at the Conservation and Agriculture. The event will be attended virtually or in person from Monday, the 29th of November to Wednesday, the 1st of December. So for more details, kindly go to www.dronesatwork.co.za. I will post that, uh, that email address and website on the chat. Thank you very much, Dr. Els. Thank you. Okay, next up, through our community programs, I will now take you through the ESRI South Africa Conservation Offering. Conservation organizations face increasing environmental challenges in biodiversity preservation efforts in our rapidly changing world that influences deforestation, climate and global warming. The use of modern and innovative conservation technologies enables efficient and increasingly real-time results to monitor these natural areas and wildlife. This ultimately leads to new insights and better understanding through conservation science and how we as conservationists can restore our natural environment. Good morning all, I'm Virosha Naidu, lead for our ESRI South Africa Community Programs. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to our first ever conservation community gathering to celebrate our conservation scientists all over Southern Africa. I am so excited that you are all able to join us to share ideas and be inspired by the great work that everyone has been doing in the conservation stream across our extraordinary and diverse continent. Some of our valued users will be sharing how they are protecting the biodiversity for future generations using ESRI technology. But before we get started with the great success stories from users across Southern Africa, let's start by understanding ESRI South Africa's community programs. The community program acts to support a broad range of diverse programs and it is the most effective way for ESRI South Africa to contribute to the National Development Program and the Sustainable Development Goals for the United Nations. We are committed to supporting organizations working in conservation, environmental protection and sustainable development. I also want to convey that you are part of the most powerful global community of conservationists and we would like you and your organization to leverage GIS to better understand, manage and adapt to the complex challenges you are working to address by taking advantage of ESRI's conservation program offering. Fundamentally, ESRI's contribution to conservation is our flagship technology platform called ArcGIS. The product has over 50 years of continuous software development. It is not simply a product or even a platform. Today, it is a complete geospatial infrastructure for conservationists. I don't want to scare you away, but it's worth taking a moment to explain what we mean by that. Our geospatial infrastructure for conservationists is a collection of rift service enabled systems, providing application and services for a wide variety of purposes. Organizations that use this infrastructure are able to share content, services and applications beyond just the individual user or organization level. The geospatial infrastructure for conservationists is important for conservations scientists because it allows conservation organizations and NPOs and NGOs to support practical integration of all activities related to conservation programs. It also enables communities to connect with other public and private organizations, taking advantage of each other's data services and even applications. Since this infrastructure supports connected desktop, 
web applications, open data, and other offline field data collections. It has the capability today to bring together all workflows across the community of practice to address complex environmental challenges. Let's find out how you can take advantage of the geospatial infrastructure for conservation. ESRI South Africa through ESRI Inc. offers three packages that form part of the ESRI conservation offerings. First up, we have the ESRI Conservation Program that offers qualified organizations for the first initial 12 months a free supply of desktop software and access to ArcGIS online software. Second, we have the ESRI Nonprofit Program that offers qualified NPO and NGO organizations a free 12 month of renewable desktop software and access to ArcGIS online software. Organizations only pay a low administration cost yearly to gain access to this technology. Lastly, we have the ESRI Conservation Solutions Protected Area Management. The solution provides qualified organizations that are mandated to protect a protected area or land with access to free ArcGIS online solutions through to 2030. This will enable the organization to improve operations and effectively manage protected areas. The solution will help our organizations collect real-time information monitor the status of the protected area operations and coordinate with local communities. Let's look at the eligibility requirements for the three programs mentioned. First up, we have the popular ESRI conservation program running for over 30 years. ESRI has already supported over 10,000 clients. Your eligibility for this conservation grant is that you must be interested in supporting conservation programs. The license can only be utilized for non-commercial purposes. Organizations must also be willing to share the user or success stories to inspire others. Second up, our ESRI nonprofit program. In order for you to qualify for this license, you have to be a registered NPO or NGO organization. You must also only use this license for non-commercial purposes. Lastly, we have the ESRI Conservation Solution Protected Area Management. Here, the organization must be assigned to manage a protected area. ESRI South Africa has partnered with Map Scientific Services to help our users or organizations in the conservation space to amplify their impact by extending the reach of the science of wear. Map Scientific Services will assist these organizations to configure and deploy their ArcGIS suite of software that is designed to unlock the full potential of GIS to support their mission and vision. The ESRI Conservation Offerings provide geospatial technology to assist qualified organizations to deploy conservation solutions across the organization and help the conservationists to improve conservation operations and enhance ecosystem services to achieve sustainable development in Southern Africa. ESRI South Africa's conservation program contains location-based intelligence and spatial analyses that are needed to build and maintain a healthy South African community. For more information on board in the ESRI Conservation Program, please contact Verosha at esri-southafrica.com. Great to be here and thank you for this opportunity. It's always great to speak about conservation GIS. I had a long extensive career with Peace Box Foundation spanning 20 years, which offered me great um, opportunities um, to meet with a great diverse group of people, organizations, many stakeholders, um, and during that time, I identified a small gap and hence um, embarked upon the establishment of CBIO. Very briefly, um, I'd like to share a little bit about CBIO. Um, most of the clients that I've engaged with have been to offer GI strategy, various integrations and interoperability. I'm also just sharing knowledge about um, conservation related technology application. Um, and then I'd share a little bit about the geo blockchain platform, which we refer to as conservation by regenerative space. I would argue that most of us working in conservation chose to do so, um, not to work with people, but rather to work with wildlife and work in wild areas look at preserving large landscapes and offering expertise and skills towards that. Uh, not for a second did I ever anticipate that my career would be so people dominated and people orientated. Uh, you place your lives in the hands of bush pilots, 
You engage with practitioners, training them in the use of hardware, software, engaging um, people of diverse different cultures, red Indians in Canada, uh, rock stars on the beaches of turtle nesting sites, um, all the way through to Colombian rainforests with a diverse group of people. Um, and all of this alludes to and shows the value and the importance that it is to engage people and the way that they engage and consider the environment. CBIO looks to transform the business as usual approach to conservation um, offering solutions which drive innovation and the application of technologies. Um, and this all centered around the human aspect. The philosophy and approach of transboundary conservation and hands across borders has a far deeper meaning after all. This approach requires the bridging of gaps between and within organizations and even individuals. Um, in order to achieve this, um, there's no way of actually achieving this without the strong visualization and analytical powers of GIS. And it's for this reason that CBIO approached ESRI for a conservation grant for which we are most grateful. Applying technologies is relatively easy. Introducing software solutions to refined processes, not too much of a problem at all. What remains to be a challenge is the people component. It is very challenging altering people's perceptions, convincing them of new approaches to undertaking and running programs or projects. To emphasize the importance of this approach and convincing people of the role in a changing and ever-changing world, the following is an adoption from Harold Liebert, which is referred to as the people, process and technology framework. And it is by no means new. This study dates back to the 60s and was tailored to facilitate applied organizational change within industry. The Venn diagram clearly illustrates touch points between these three aspects of applying technologies. And we could and should concentrate on the bullseye, which is that of human-centered design and change management. The CASA online tool, which has a lot to do with the monitoring evaluation framework, dates back to the time whilst they are still with Peace Parks Foundation. Um, the integration of many different indicators, uh, measuring impacts that are relevant for the progress and the success of this transboundary conservation area were considered and integrated to an online platform. Many of these have been transformed into various web apps, various story maps, all to visualize and show the progress that there is um, being made with regards to impact and the measuring of indicators that support transfrontier conservation efforts. Most recently, CBIO implemented the use of the Open Data Cube to look at the transformation of processing earth observation data um, for monitoring fire occurrences. Um, also, very importantly, undertaking a rapid transformation of land cover and looking to identify um, land transformation, productivity um, with regards to wildlife dispersal areas and the identification of um, ecological corridors and linkages within this landscape. Similarly, what's happening in this very same landscape um, across Southern Africa um, and actually more widely dispersed than that is so many organizations um, researchers and even agencies that are looking to measure the impact of human wildlife conflict. What's very frustrating is the lack of cohesion, the lack of collaboration that ought to be taking place in this space and in this realm. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with sovereignty of data, but what's frustrating is that none are considering the standardized means of how data and information is collected and that is very simply put together with the use of um, spatial tools that are very easily customizable, as we would know through the Esri suite. Um, and this would not steal away from any of the customization that would be necessary on the business intelligence side of things to retain and maintain sovereignty when it comes to 
data-driven decision support for each of the respective countries that are involved. So whilst there's a battle with regards to the collaboration on the human wildlife conflict side of things, what was very progressive and um, I'm happy to, to report was the recent launch of the Snakebite information and data platform. And this shows that it can be done, that regional and global databases and repositories can be um, put together and shared and, and um, that there's, there's a willingness to actually contribute to and make use of these databases. Um, this is um, developed with the help of ESRI and again showing and showcasing the reach that ESRI have um, in, in a global and um, a regional footprint point of view. Very similarly, there's this global development um, platform which looks to collect and collate information regarding sustainable development goals. And I think this is key and paramount. It, it forces um, and encourages um, programs and projects to contribute data towards SDGs for national and regional reporting in a similar fashion. I consider citizen science as a certain game changer for conservation. CBIO has recently become involved with wildlife and ecological investments, which is a non-profit which drives citizen science tourism. Students that visit garner geospatial skills and knowledge while they gather field data and information, all to do with long-term ecological research in various protected areas. Here's some food for thought. Consider the potential of citizen science compared to the time, effort and energy which is spent positively or detrimentally on social media. A recent seminar series was offered to the School of Wildlife Conservation, which is part of the African Leadership University by CBIO, offering their students an approach to the application of technologies for conservation. CBIO firmly believes that the early adoption, innovation and creativity needs to be driven strongly whilst training in these environmental sectors. An important aspect of this is breaking down the perceived barriers of complexity and lack of access to and availability of certain tools. CBIO started off by offering GI strategy to regenerative space. Um, we held an agreement with them to showcase the work being done on geo blockchain, earth observation and internet of things. This, ag this agreement has evolved into a merger as I've now joined regenerative space um, and what we are developing, which we term conservation by regenerative space. In actual fact, we soft launched the platform and the proof of concept later this month and we look to drive significant impact in the coming years regarding funding support and individualized reporting based on conservation spend. The in initial catalytic involvement with regenerative space has allowed us to now become a registered ESRI nonprofit program. So again, our acknowledgement and our appreciation to Verosha and the team at ESRI South Africa and ESRI Inc. Conservation by regenerative space, as mentioned, combines earth observation, the internet of things and field-based tools to cross-validate results of work and of impacts. ESRI's suite of tools knit these interoperable systems together and we look forward to expanding these in the coming months and years. By subdividing a project site or a program into quantifiable and qualified blocks, all features and natural assets within a landscape can be measured. This offers a mechanism to consider value and potential investment. An example of this is, for, is, is carbon stock, but includes other aspects of biodiversity and ecosystem services. And how these change over time is what ultimately offers a meaning of measuring their value. An important element of validating and creating records of trust and accountability is by means of collecting and measuring biophysical attributes autonomously through IoT. In addition, these data and assets are transparently written to a distributed ledger, which allows and offers an account of records and proof of work. Code contracts 
importantly allow for autonomous workflows or actioning of microservices and financial transactions to take place. Second to last slide um, is just to, to bring home that which, which we hoping to achieve today um, with, with this um, community of conservation GIS folk and support of ESRI South Africa, ESRI Inc. is um, to, to build and develop a network of knowledge exchange um, about innovation, about GIS collaboration um, and catalyzing, fast tracking um, people who wish to get in, to, to start off on a career in conservation GIS. So um, let's see how we can all contribute towards achieving and reaching out and, and, and making a difference for the environment. As mentioned, um, we at CBIO are choosing to do things in an unconventional manner. Um, so I've yet to turn away a client um, and most of the work that's been discussed here today has been pro bono and offering um, some free services. So um, if there was a website or a platform called Buy Me A Beer, I'd be choosing that. But um, please do consider buying me a coffee to help support the work that we're doing. Thank you very much for this opportunity again. Um, it's always a privilege to, to share information and um, to network with you like-minded folk in conservation. Good day, everyone. My name is Michael Moll from Map Scientific Services. And in this presentation, we're going to showcase how ESU technology is being leveraged in a South African protected area by looking at some of the work being done in Babanango Game Reserve. But to start off, I would like to introduce to you Craig Symington from the African Habitat Conservancy to give you a short introduction into Babanago. Good morning. I'm Craig Symington, Chief Technology Officer of African Habitat Conservancy. African Habitat Conservancy is a conservation management company focusing on the establishment of conservation areas and the rehabilitation of flora and fauna endemic to the areas in which the company operates. Our vision is to support the conservation of African wildlife by investing in conservation projects, working closely with local community trusts, forming a blueprint for how land can generally benefit local communities that partner with government and private sector in conservation initiatives. For our first project, we've worked closely with Ezumbela Kaiserman Wildlife and the Emakwene Community Trust in the Babanaga region of Zululand to establish Babanaga Game Reserve. Babanaga Game Reserve lies within the Amphalozi Biodiversity Economic Node, a significant part of the government's economic strategy, which encourages partnerships between government, communities and private corporations to achieve national conservation targets. Combined with neighbouring game farms, the new reserve is some 22,000 hectares and is a place of extraordinary biodiversity. To date, the value of the project exceeds 400 million rand. As a greenfield site, we are extremely fortunate in that we could look to best of breed technologies as well as all management platforms. Our requirement was based on the need for the processing and management of large amounts of geospatial data from different sources, such as IoT device inputs, wildlife reports, as well as pin drops and reports of damage or work requirements from the field, and putting these into an easy to use, user-friendly format. Our initial requirement was primarily security and animal tracking. This evolved very, very quickly into the collection of data from remote weather stations, foot patrols, wildlife sightings, as well as the day-to-day -day maintenance reports. Our concentration on all forms of IoT means we need a platform that can collect and process data from these different input technologies. We have invested heavily in a robust backhaul network with both Sigfox and Lower gateways. We plan to integrate satellite tracking in the very, very near future. We chose the ARC for Protected Area Management Platform for its ease of use, ability to process the data and deliver it in a user-friendly format. Our security and facilities department have quickly come to rely on the reports the platform can generate, as well as the easy-to-view dashboards. As our organization expands and we look to our next project, I have no doubt we will continue to use the a pan and add our new projects to the same platform. Working with our integration partner, Map Scientific has allowed us to build and deploy a joint operations center that provides support for all aspects of the day-to-day -day functions of the game reserve using the A4 pan. Great, so let's have a look at how ArcGIS has been implemented in Babanango itself. In the form of an ArcGIS online account, we've created one centralized geospatial solution for Babanango, where management and staff can access applications, surveys, dashboards for viewing, tools for reporting on all their data and workflows, and management around specific initiatives. 
all on one platform in one location. The initiatives included in the solution are diverse, as you heard from Craig. This includes security, infrastructure and asset management, remote sensing to monitor the landscape, and ecological initiatives related to the tracking of priority species, as well as wildlife monitoring. Esri technology and the use of A4PAM is ideal in this case, as it provides a secure and flexible framework for both deploying useful applications and integrating other conservation technology, regardless of what data inputs you have to holistically support workflows in the park related to each of these initiatives. So I'd like to show you uh, some of that technology in action. The reserve management has implemented a large network coverage for LoRa and Sigfox devices, enabling the use of a variety of devices for varying applications. This includes fence alert devices, animal trackers, weather stations, devices for tracking the movement of assets, vehicles, and people. One of the more important functions of the IoT devices is for initiatives linked to security. Here we integrated all of the security related data into applications to view live feeds. For example, here we have access to the latest feeds for the location of priority species and for the latest feeds for where trackers, rangers and even vehicles were last seen. We also have alerts linked to fence monitor devices distributed around the entire perimeter of the reserve. These are activated to send out alerts when the fence is disturbed or broken, as shown here in this example. We've also included workflows to respond to these alerts in real time, helping to not only record issues, but also optimize workflows for staff to respond to these issues and provide direct feedback to management over time. The network coverage also means that these live feed applications can be viewed anywhere and anytime by staff and management, even on their mobile devices. IoT integration is not only utilized for security initiatives. Here we have a dashboard illustrating a workflow for the use of IoT integration in infrastructure management. To overcome labor intensive exercises, devices have been placed inside water tanks to automatically detect water levels and alert management to high or low volumes of water over time, saving both time and resources for staff. Weather is another important aspect on the reserve that can affect management. Here we have created a dashboard incorporating live data feeds from four weather stations in the reserve, getting live updates for staff working in different areas of the reserve. Together with weather, fires are a significant threat in this region. Therefore, remotely sensed MODIS and VERS thermal hotspot data has also been incorporated into this dashboard to view active fires within or around the reserve. Moving away from IoT, a large component of security is the use of ranges on the ground collecting data. Here we utilize ArcGIS Survey123 as a tool for effective data collection of observations and activities observed during those foot patrols. Once collected, data can then be viewed in dashboards such as this one in the control room itself. The dashboard keeps track of the data collected from the mobile devices from the ranges during the patrols. This includes information on poaching or evidence events. All the data collected during these patrols can then be accessed and viewed on, viewed on the application. From there, the data can also be managed, edited and sorted through various workflows that enable incidences to be effectively assessed by management, assigned and then completed. The same workflows have been implemented for infrastructure management where staff can report issues linked to the maintenance of the reserve, facilities, or even the vehicles, optimizing workflows of logging issues, managing staff, and responding to issues in real time. Here we have an example of where someone has logged an issue for road maintenance in the reserve. The use of ArcGIS Online also means that resources from Living Atlas are at your fingertips. Here, a library of relatable, uh, remotely sensed data is available for staff and management to access, and assess landscape level changes or threats across the entire reserve. This may include the latest high resolution satellite imagery, standard vegetation, elevation and topographical maps, or data linked to fire detection, deforestation, or even encroachment. All useful data for effective management. Last but not least, reporting and long-term monitoring is important to evaluate the success or failures of initiatives. In Babanango, we have implemented various report generating applications 
that allow managers to report on observations or incidences linked to any data collected in any of the initiatives. Here, an automatic report is generated on incidences reported during the last month, showing the location as well as the auxiliary data linked to those incidences. Right, so what are the ultimate outcomes here? It's clear that if technology and specifically geospatial technology is fully embraced, it can be an effective way to address protected area management challenges at scale and under changing environments. And if leveraged effectively, it allows management to manage changes quickly, understand and analyze those changes in real time and respond quicker and more effectively. Ultimately, this results in a more effective protected area management approach, improved conservation outcomes and a more resilient landscape. And I think Baba Nango is a perfect reflection of this. And we look forward to seeing what more can be done in the near future. Right, so that's it from my side. On behalf of Craig and I, thank you so much for listening, as well as the opportunity to share what we have done. Appreciate your time. Cheers. Good day. My name is Tsarakha Nomazongo from Botswana. I am here representing Department of Wildlife and National Parks, standing in for the director. The Department of Wildlife and National Park is mandated to manage and conserve the country's wildlife resources and their habitat. Botswana, for your information, is one of the Africans' greatest game destination, and 17, roughly 17% 17 of this country is devoted to national parks and game reserves. The department requires um, a software that will assist to improve and effectively manage its operations. In 2019, we were afforded the opportunity to receive a free 10-year ArcGIS solution license via the ESRIS Conservation Solutions Protected Area Management Program, PEM in short. So the presentation is um, done in four critical parts, being a little bit of a little bit of background, the maps built using ArcGIS web applications, the key takeaways, and the challenges. Department of Wildlife and National Parks used a grant from USAID through Resilient Waters Project and uh, it adopted or is willing to adopt the digital way of collecting data and um, when this thing uh, when this system or when this this uh, solution was uh, casted the department then saw it fit to use it in one of the divisions, which is problem animal control. Problem animal control is a, a division in Department of Wildlife whereby it deals with a human wildlife conflict. And for your information, they collect huge lots and lots amount of um, data in a day. And we can imagine in a year how much data is collected so we had challenges in managing this um, large data because um, a human being is prone to making mistakes especially, especially spelling mistakes one and two this information or the the the, the paper based way of collecting data is not your reference three for you to make a an analysis or a report we have to take this data input it in excel and uh, start fiddling with uh, the apps found in excel to produce a to produce a report now that uh, we have a solution conservation solution i think these challenges will be dealt with indeed we will have uh, no problem no problems in analyzing the data please allow me to that the, the system came with in analyzing or just displaying the data 
This is the dashboard. This is the dashboard. 5,212 5, incidents have been populated into the system. And this is the outcome. You can see that uh, the incidents are plot all around the country. And just as in a snapshot, we can tell that out of those incidences, central in this place, in this um, central is the one, central is this part of the country, is the one that have a high number of animal, problem animal incidents, followed by Ngamiland, which is at uh, 1.7 Ngamiland is this part of the country and when we look at that uh, report or that uh, snap uh, analysis of the, the, the incidents Hansi Hansi no not Hansi but Southern Southern over there it shows that uh, the, the, the reports that are into the system in Southern are very insignificant and this is like i said using just the dash the dashboard we can know where the problem is one of the the apps that we um the system comes with is the web app the web app is a more detailed analysis or way of reporting the incidents like we see this is the the same map as that side but there were analysis that were done here let me take out that uh, and check that if i check that we can see that this is just the the previous map but now we want to analyze for density there you go this is the density of the incidents the darker the area or the darker the color shows that shows where the the problem is concentrated um for example we have this area around here showing that there is a lot of activity going in there um followed by that area at the top and we can also make a heat map or a, a map that shows pro profoundly showing the showing the the hot spots that is the map it shows that like i said it shows that these three areas of botswana are the ones that are mostly hit by problem animals that is the human wildlife conflict in these areas is very high now let's go back to the the presentations those are the beautiful um apps that came um let's go back to the presentation the takeaways these are the takeaways as the conservation solution protected area management supports digital transformation like i said before we are moving away from the paper based way of collecting data into the systematical way that the digital world whereby the 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 the, the report or the incident or the record is geo referenced PSC concept will be has been taken or will be taken as the pilot um, pilot site or the pilot or the case study after further analysis and evaluation of the system then it will be rolled out into other wildlife um, management perspectives like the the monitoring of the population trends and with the time the paper based way of doing things will be done with we found a solution thank you
Hi everyone, I work for the Mapuma Langa Tourism and Parks Agency and I'd just like to tell you about our use of the conservation and protected area management conservation grants. So just grateful to you Israel. thank you very much for that. Um, so as an organisation, we are parish total, so we are semi-government and we report to a board and we have a CEO. Uh, as our organisation has a dual function of tourism marketing and biodiversity conservation in the province of uh, Mapuma Langa in South Africa. We are responsible for the management of protected areas and the conservation of biodiversity outside of protected areas. My role is really as a biodiversity planner and GIS support as a GIS manager. Uh, we manage 29 nature reserves, totaling 238,000 hectares, and uh, we have a biodiversity sector plan which tries to ensure sustainable development outside of our protected areas. And um, this is about Barberton, Macondra World Heritage Site, and this is just a map of our protected areas. So we've really been focusing um, on rolling out uh, desktop GIS since 2014 and the release of ArcGIS Pro. Um, we involved in projects, um, national, provincial and local government scales. Um, our biodiversity sector plan, which I introduced in the previous slide, yeah, is just a clip for one of the local municipalities where we try and embed it. Um, this is in Bombela uh, Spatial Learning Framework. We're trying to ensure that our spatial products are used at um, the local municipal scale too. Um, as an organization, we're responsible for law enforcement, environmental impact assessment, so that's uh, when you comment on mining impacts and the likes, mining applications. Um, we're also involved in particular expansion, and we're very fortunate that um, this year we've managed to secure 28,350 hectares of uh, of new protected areas, although not managed by us, we just assisted in the process, um, but that being one of our, our mandates. And there's just the use of um, our protected area network, um, no, the use of our, our corridors to try and link up our climate change priorities. And there was the use of uh, EBK regression prediction to downscale rainfall and then the fine scale delineation of strategic resource areas in the country. Um, so we're moving strongly towards ArcGIS Online, getting our data um, into ArcGIS Online, uh, getting our, our setting up maps which are both either publicly accessible or only to certain groups of users. Um, we're using uh, user types, roles and privileges and folders for the uploading of data a lot more. Um, we even share some data sets like mobile map packages which the user can then just log in and uh, download onto their phones. This is our landing page for the public um, at that website, that web address. But we are looking towards uh, rolling out JS more and more um, in ArcGIS Online um, under the Protected Area Management Grant. Um, it provides us with more licenses than just a few desktop uh, JS licenses. So we're starting to roll out JS. Um, initially, I must say as a, as a being more familiar with these, these, these apps and the software, I can see great potential, but sadly, I need to convey that potential to others, and that's not always that easy. I may think that may be the best thing to slice and slice, slice bread, but uh, my, my staff may not necessarily agree with me. <coughs> so my focus is really through implementation through demonstration. So they need to come to me with a need, and then we'll try and see how we can use the mobile apps and the platform to try and address those needs. Yeah, as an example, where our wetland ecologist needed to validate wetland points, um, we're busy assessing the accuracy of these national wetland maps and a wetland model, um, so it's predicted wetlands. So we generated these random points both within wetlands and outside of wetlands, and then we could confirm whether a particular point is a wetland or not. Um, and the blue would mean it's being validated, it is a wetland. The black point would mean, for example, it's not a wetland. Um, and the yellow points are those not yet evaluated. Um, so it's a great way we can then refine our wetland maps and then gather a whole bunch of data about wetland condition, um, threats, and the actual wetland classification. Um, we're also working with other provinces and sand parks, um, Kruger parks staff in particular, uh, Robin Peterson, um, to roll this out within the park. And just, it's great, you can use dashboards then to visualize um, the validated wetland points and this just shows you, for example, where the sites are. And as you zoom into a site, all these metrics update to show you the wetland classification or condition or any of the, the variables that you captured in the field. I always like to talk about um, the Survey 123. Um, 
I manage our Turtle Species database, so responsible for Turtle Species monitoring within the organization. So we recently, um, about a year and a half, used Survey123 to now try and record um, plot data. Um, so Survey123 focuses more on the form and uh, filling in our fields than the map. The map is of less importance. And it's currently set up so that if someone submits a record, I'm sent an email, I can then uh, create a report. So you have exported a report that now shows this plot, any photographs, a map, zoomed out, map zoomed in, and then this gets printed and put on file and also captured into an access database. Um, so yeah, I'm just really enjoying Survey 123. And this is just shows you another dashboard. Dashboards are so easy to spin up um, to visualize the data that's been captured for any project. Um, no coding required and just a bit of plug and play and configuration. So um, these are all the species we've been collecting. So uh, if someone takes a photograph and you click on the site, then uh, the location, you can see a photograph of the species. And this just shows the increase in use over time. Um, this was summer last year and this is going into winter. So it's starting to pick up now at the end of winter. Um, Arctic Field Maps is then one of the more recent apps that is developed that really integrates the functionality of Collector, Explorer and Tracker. Um, and in this particular use case, I, we're using it for a project uh, assessing the um, biodiversity importance of a, a, a very, um, what do you call an old protected area, previously gazetted under old order legislation. So we have to do a reassessment. We use it for bioblitz surveys, uh, wildlife economy projects. Uh, a Red Plus project in our World Heritage Site, at the Geosites, uh, land invasion on our boundary of our protected areas and even in some anti-poaching patrols on our reserves. So that's just our use of field maps and there's a, a, a screen capture to show you or some of the three screen captures of the field maps app when you're working on a particular expansion project. Uh, it has your tracking functionality embedded in it if you, if you have the right license and you can keep track of your movements. It helps you for uh, generating the maps and where you've been surveying as well as how to get your way out of some areas. This is very tricky. Um, it's just off the map here. No roads, very bad roads. So yeah, it's great to find your way in and out of places. Um, and you can just turn on layers on and off as needed and you can use it to record um, the location of any sense of species, maybe there's a wattle jungle that needs to be removed and it'll calculate the size and the likes. So yeah, we're just looking at uh, Care for Wild. Um, they, an NGO that um, are managing or assisting us with the management of one of our nature reserves, the Barberton Nature Reserve. It also falls within the uh, Barberton Macondra World Heritage Site. And uh, Sam Saliers is the uh, J specialist and he's been amazing with his grasp of um, the, the apps. I spent a day demonstrating Survey123, Quick Capture, Dashboards, and he's been able to just very easily pick up and run with it. They're doing it Survey123 for household surveys, the camera traps, Quick Capture for road damage, rhino monitoring. Uh, you can then spin up some dashboards for the, to visualize the results for with his manager um, and the funders. So um, yeah, just a, a great project. And this just shows you the dashboard for the rhino monitoring. Um, and it shows the location of the different individuals, their uh, feeding and their behavior, and uh, who the different um, assessors are, or, or people busy doing the monitoring. And I'll just quickly jump into these. So the way I see it is that uh, is you provide a lot of these um, different apps. And uh, depending on a certain project, you configure, the, configure them differently. So for that wetland example, the data is created, all those random points in ArcGIS Pro, published to ArcGIS Online, and then consumed in ArcGIS Collector. And then you can visualize the data in dashboard, or you can bring it back into ArcGIS Pro for further analysis, which is what we did. But the workflow nowadays is rather replacing Collector with ArcGIS Field Maps, a bit more powerful, has a tracking ability embedded in it, um, and you have more functionality coming too. And you can visualize the data and further anal analyze it. Um, or Survey123, capture the data in Survey123, then send it to ArcGIS Online for, for mapping or visualization or visualization or analysis. Dashboard um, for your management and for reporting. 
and then ArcGIS profile for the analysis, the more powerful power users. So just um, depending on the project, you can configure these apps differently. But yeah, if you think about the, the depth of the different apps that usually have um, published or developed, it provides you with great flexibility and functionality. So just in conclusion, I'm very grateful to Esri for the, uh, the software grants um, and that they really, you know, it's difficult to stay ahead of all the progress. Um, the software with each release or each year is uh, progressing in leaps and bounds and uh, yeah, we stay on top of it, but they provide an amazing amount of functionality that I really find works really well. Um, what you create in one app can be consumed in another and then yeah, export it to a different app. So um, yeah, just working very well and that um, you can use groups if you're worried about security of data. Um, you can have groups and any data shared with that group um, can only be viewed by staff that you've included in that group. So it's a great way for managing your secure data and you can make groups which are public and you can share data that you'd like public to you. And yeah, it's, it's super easy. Um, I think a lot of us staff in my organization thinks I'm a coder and I can develop all these apps. Uh, I must be some form of rocket scientist, which I'm certainly not. You don't need any coding, it's quite easy just to configure and the apps work really well. So very really easy to get on top of. And um, yeah, just the way Sam Solias has done wonders with uh, Care for Wild um, and being able to get them up and running and sharing data with us then the MTPA. Uh, Arcturus Field Maps, just two of my favorite um, mobile apps at the moment, which I've run through. Um, and just in the interest of time, just say that we are looking forward now to rolling out the Arcturus Solutions for Conservation Template apps. Um, so we've now focused a lot on the individual apps, but now I'd like to see how we can leverage the, uh, the different templates that have been set up to try and roll out our software. Thank you very much. I must be honest, Law, every time I listen to our presenters and they stem such passion, I actually get goosebump moments. Well done, everyone, on such an excellent job on using the conservation offering package with such drive, innovation and passion to ensure that we receive or, or that we achieve sustainable development in Southern Africa. I do apologize for the slight technical difficulty that we've had. I would now like to invite our presenters on camera. That will be Craig, Mike, um, and Craig Symington, Kent uh, Berger, um, and no, 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 not Anastasia, Tashwara. I don't think Tashwara is here with us. Um, no. And Mike, yeah, got Mike. Mike is going to be representing Map Scientific Services. Okay, so questions. We have one question from our audience. Lauren, would you like to take care of that? Sure. Um, sorry, let me just bring that up. Okay, we've got one question. Um, I think this is for Craig Simington and Michael. Um, how many IoT sensors, although I know Mervyn also spoke about IoT, um, how many IoT sensors do you have and how do you get that information into your dashboards? Okay, so, so I, can, I can answer the number of devices are over 300 now and we continue to expand that. It's a mix between LoRa, Sigfox and some satellites. Um, we collected using the gateways on a high, high masts, and then Mike will explain how we take that data and put it onto the dashboards. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, it's, it's, it's not a simple answer, but I'll try and keep it simple as I'm not the technologist in the group, but it really does depend on the manufacturer themselves. We, we're working with a number of different manufacturers, and each of those manufacturers have their own backends, essentially. And they're able to send or push data through to data stores, uh, that we use to format the data in the way it needs to be viewed or uh, allocated on ArcGIS online itself. But uh, essentially, we try and do the back-end stuff so that uh, the reserve itself just has the pretty data store in ArcGIS online, ready all formatted data to be the same. So Craig, you are the reserve manager. Can you please let us know why was it important to actually have our business partner map scientific services to help configure and deploy your application? Um, the polite answer. There was no, we actually sat on the ground for almost nine months and we had played around with it, uh, the platform, and we hadn't actually achieved anything. And my colleague, Amy Hood started uh, working closely with me and having a, a GIS background, 
she started doing research and she came back with a, a number of candidates. And after we met with um, Andrew and Michael from MAPS, um, we decided that we were going to partner with them to develop the integration. Thank you, Craig, for that. Um, Craig Beach, how was your experience uh, in utilizing uh, the technology that was provided as part of your conservation package to assist you to enable these conservation solutions for CBIO? I think one of the key factors is communication and, and visualization. And I think it's always easier to convey a message and, and to tell a story. Um, and, and to, I think a lot of the stuff is quite complex with integrations of, you know, very disparate technologies that people are firstly intimidated by and sometimes feel very um, isolated from thinking it's very advanced and the likes. But um, if I'm doing it, then pretty much anybody can do it. So, but what's powerful and wonderful about GIS is that visualization, that communication factor, which is, um, I think it's a common language. And I think Esri have used that a few times in, in their slogans through the annual user conferences and the likes. Um, and, and I think I find that the most powerful actual mechanism that, that I can leverage. Yeah. Great. Mavik, I have a question for you. I know you for about six years and your choice of product has always been ArcGIS technology. How was your uh, migration from ArcMap to ArcGIS Pro? I suppose I'm one of those JS nerds that uh, started with, I think, Pro 1.1, where you used to just like move a shape file or do a little edit and it would crash in those early days. But it's um, I, I just come ahead, come along in leaps and bounds, and I find that the use of mobile map packages got so much more to offer than the of map. I found um, I knew of map pretty well, but I really enjoyed the transition across. And a lot of people think it's like a, a binary move, like you you with of map, and then you have to move across to ArcGIS Pro, and it's not like that at all. Um, I used to have both up and running, and if I couldn't do anything in Pro, I would shut it down, do it in of map, open it up again. But these days, I mean, I never open up, I don't open up ArcMap at all. So it wasn't, it was, it was easy. There's similar uh, routes to doing something, something very different, but that was a pretty easy move. And I must say, ArcGIS Pro, you saw with Anastasia's presentation that forest-based regression prediction. I mean, as far as I know, it's the easiest implementation of random forest. You won't find an easier application of it in another software package. So no, it just works well. And, um, I suppose it also helps to consistently use it every day. So as a JS manager, I do open up my JS software probably every single day. So that helps to stay on top of it and um, to make that migration process a bit easier. That's There's also a lot of resources. Those easy check videos I referred to earlier on. Big nerd, spend a lot of time watching those. Uh, thank you, Marvin. That's also fantastic to hear. And as part of our conservation package, you have access to free uh, e-online training. So you are also welcome to go on that e-online site and have a look at the free training options that we have available. Should you not be using uh, ArcGIS Pro, you're welcome to go through that course and migrate to ArcGIS Pro. It's a new world using ArcGIS Pro. Uh, Lauren, I think we have another question. Would I be correct by saying that? Yes. Um, would you like to take over this one? Um, yeah. Um, so sorry, this is Mervyn for you again. Could you just say more about using the ArcGIS data collection tools? What is your experience with these compared to all the other tools currently available, especially when working in communities? So I suppose I've been very fortunate to have had access to the Esri tools for a long time that I haven't needed to use the likes of Smart or the others. Um, I know we're working with Sam Tillias now they were using Smart for a while and they transitioned across um, to ArcGIS Online now. So I can't really comment much about the, the other tools. Um, but yeah, from my side is, I suppose for our needs, there's a lot of different tools out there that easily make available to us, which are easy enough to um, to work, connect together as I was giving some of those that there's examples where you can have server one, two, three feed into dashboard or access online. Or, um, I mean, I don't know if you know, if you're flying a drone these days, you can use um, quick capture. So while you're flying a drone and you're flying, you can use quick capture to, to record um, alien, in, alien plant infestations, for example. So I think what's very powerful about the easy one is that you've got that integration of the different various apps and you can string them together depending on your specific need. I hope that answers the question. 
I think that actually does. Um, would you, would any of you like to give a comment or some feedback? Uh, Craig, Mike, before we close the Q&A? I, I think I can add one thing. Um, in terms of the ArcGIS for protected area management solution, I think, you know, we, we were very fortunate with Babanango in that uh, we started with a clean slate and we could start fresh um, and, and go crazy, essentially, do a lot of initiatives and a lot of workflows. Mm -hmm. the most important to realize is that a number of protected areas already have very well-established workflows. And you can start very simply by just focusing on one or two workflows that you think you can optimize as a, as a manager. And just start simply like that, to digitize that using the various packages that ArcGIS can provide. And that's really a good starting point. I think you don't have to do everything at once all at the same time. You can start in small blocks and then build on uh, over time. Less complicated. 100%, uh, thank you, Mike. Um, okay, so I think we can close our live Q&A. Thank you very much presenters for that fantastic presentation. It was very interesting and insightful. I would now like to move on to Ken Berger, our director of Gyms Botswana. He will now briefly go through how ESRI aligns its technology to the conservation organization sustainable development goals that includes your mission and your vision. Ken Berger, you may go ahead and commence with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Verosha. Um, as you've already introduced me, I'm the director of GEMS Botswana, which is the ESRI sub-distributor for Botswana, but I'm also a SCGIS member. And as many of the other speakers have said, I've, I've been fortunate enough to attend the conference in California. And uh, at the two that I was at, the conference coordinators sort of conduct a survey at the last session, sort of looking for feedback. And my comment was, you know, why can't there be a similar networking during the year and not only in California? So I'd like to just take this opportunity to thank as we South Africa, Patrick, Verosha, and Lauren, and then Mervyn and Craig for the work with the Southern African chapter to, to provide this opportunity for networking and exchange of information. I, I think we've had 77 or up to 91 people participating. So I've been asked to sort of wrap up and, and, and speak about uh, how ESRI is aligning to the sustainable development goals. And I would sort of like to circle back to what Patrick said when he opened this is that we've just completed the COP26. And I think there's two critical steps that GIS applies to in this decade of action. And if any of us were to have to approach a decision maker in, in Botswana, that uh, would mean that you probably would end up at the Ministry of Finance. And how would we be able to advise them where capital or resources should be allocated to address the sustainability challenges? And I think all of the presenters demonstrated this in the conservation space, um, whether it's the critical habitats and the vulnerability framework that uh, was shown by Debbie and KZN or the KBAs in Mozambique or the ecosystem services in the Okavango Delta. And then the ESRI conservation program has been demonstrated it provides not only tools, but as Verosha and Mervyn indicated that it's an infrastructure or a platform to support this, this step. But the, the second step is once any resources are allocated, how would you actually know the impact of those allocations? And I think Craig's doing some interesting work on this, but this is where the SDGs come in. And ESRI has made a significant contribution to not only the first step, but the second one as well, and providing a similar infrastructure for SDG reporting. So if, um, you are aware of this and I, I hope I'm not repeating too much, but if you're not, uh, this is the work that ESRI Global has been doing with uh, the United Nations and through multilateral uh, frameworks. If you're interested in sort of keeping up on this, uh, Linda Peters uh, is a prolific uh, poster on Twitter and she often is, posting from some of these forums that, that ESRI helps uh, collaborate with. And so this is what has been done with ESRI and the United Nations on the SDGs. And this is uh, the technology behind this is, is ArcGIS Hub, 
So this is a landing page at which there's a card for each one of the sustainable development goals. And if you can't read this up here, it's essentially an indicator database that provides geospatial data as web services for the indicators. So most of what's been presented today relates either to the goal 15, which is life on land. And then we did have the one presentation on life below water. And so this then links off into the, to the United Nations where you can then start to explore what people are doing in relation to the, the different goals. So you can see here for SDG 15, there's 12 targets and there's 27 existing publications and, and 12 events going on. So following through on that, it would take you to what I think most people now will see as another ESRI ArcGIS Online and um, hub application. So this is how you can now access the different indicators. I tried to find one that's relevant to some of the presentations. So this is the indicator 15.4.1 on mountain KBAs. And you can see, or you should be able to see if you follow this, that it's a feature layer. And then who, who's put this information together. So then across the top, there's also access to the SDG API. And then if any of the people that have uh, published this information out have put together data storage, that is there as well. So this then is a further example of how you can access the SDG goal indicator information. I tried to find a, a positive one. Uh, this is South Africa's KBA's indicators, and it, it's looking at the key biodiversity areas for freshwater and then the terrestrial. So then there's the current status. So South Africa is at least up within the last year or two. Many times it, it's much farther behind in some of the other countries. So. This is a nice way to navigate and you can see that there's actually all 17 here and it's much more than just life on land. And I think that is possibly where GIS really comes in is that it, it's actually a relationship between the different goals and the different targets and the different indicators. And, and the way we are trying to work with the SDGs is along the transformation pathways um, there's six of them, so, as I think you heard Mazongo say in the presentation on Botswana is trying to look into digital transformation and, for sustainable development, and that's transformation six. And then the one that I think has been presented pretty extensively today is transformation four on sustainable food, land, water, and the oceans. And so you can see there that how the, the, the goals that relate to these pathways are, are indicated. So then this is where I think it becomes clear that you can see how GIS would, would build out and support this. Um, this is transformation four and the coding there, it may, it may not be too evident in the graphs, but it's uh, does the SDG, is it reinforced by one of the other ones or does the intermediate outputs have direct influence on one of the SDGs? And I think it was, um, Craig that has been talking about the people dominated ecosystems and, and how people are influencing our ability to achieve the SDGs. And, and this slide here shows the relationship. So if you're, even if you're working in a protected area, what about the people around that protected area? So there's an indicate, there's a goal on poverty. What is their socioeconomic status? There's the goal on hunger. There is a goal on gender equity. So it all relates to being able to try to achieve this SDG 15. I, I, I really liked um, Debbie's approach where she says, basically we're setting a stage for actors to play out on. And I think this is an example of how that stage would look in relation to all of these relationships between the, the different sustainable development goals. So I've, I've tried to, I didn't put any links in here, but I will I'll put this there, that there's a number of resources that ESRI's put together to assist in using 
the technology with the SDG. So this is learn.arcgis.com. And there's actually a path there. So it's how to solve problems for the sustainable development goals. And then there's another one that we've looked at is exploring the sustainable development goals with ArcGIS Pro. And um, I think if you go to, to this site, search for SDGs, then many of the links to the resources I just put up there um, will pop up and, and you can explore this uh, the same way that I've presented it here. So I've, that's what I have. Um, I think Lauren, I'm to hand back over to you now. Thank you very much, Kent, um, and thanks for wrapping things up so, so well for us. Um, I think it's very important that we, we get that connection between what we're actually doing in the conservation space um, and how that um, aligns to our SDGs and it's becoming obviously coming more and more to the fore. So thank you, Kent, and you know, once again, thank you to all the presenters for their presentations and um, you know, the time and effort that they put into that. So, um, before we end off, because Kent was the last presentation for today, um, we are going to announce the winners of our Joe State Quiz. Drum roll! <laughs> um, and thank you for everyone to, for participating. I was quite amazed how quick everybody was. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at my screen because I've got the, the results in front of me. Um, we had probably at least 30 within the first four minutes of posting the link. So that was quite impressive. Well done. Um, but before I announce the, the, the winners, I'll quickly go through for those of you who are interested, the correct answers to the quiz. So which creature spends most of its time alone rather in groups rather than in a group? And the answer was a leopard. Um, most of you seem to have got that one right. What is the closest living relative of a hippo? And uh, there was a hint in our keynote address, that is the whale. <laughs> How wide can a hippo stretch its jaws? And the correct answer is 150 degrees. How heavy is an ostrich egg? The answer is, well, the correct answer is 1.4 kilos. How long is a giraffe's tongue? 46 centimeters. So that's, that's, that's like, like that oh, long. No, V, it's a ruler and a half. Yeah, so a ruler is like, yeah, no, no. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, it's right, yeah. And how many muscles are in an elephant's trunk? 40,000. <laughs> That's a big number. And the last one, how long is South Africa's coastline? Um, the answer is 2,800 kilometers of beautiful coastline that we've got. So well our winners for our, per our personal use licenses are, um, and excuse me for if I don't get the um, pronunciation correct, um, so the first correct um, entry in was Fahima Daniels from South Africa National Parks. Well done, came to you. Um, Denton, you were second with the correct answers from Peace Parks Foundation. Then th in third place was Simone Turon from ARC. Um, fourth place was Amy Hode, and I think that is Craig's um, colleague from African Habitat Cons Conservancy. And um, fifth place is Samuel Sillias for from Care for Wild. So well done, guys. That's excellent. Um, thank you for participating. And uh, your prize will be in the mail. Literally, we will <laughs> send you an email with the with all the their information. And with that, um, we come to the end of our conservation community event GIS Day event today. Um, really, thank you everyone for your participation and once again to our presenters. I'd also personally just like to thank Varosha and my colleague Otto, who is in the, the back, um, doing all the, um, the sound and um, to put a, an event like this together is, um, is no easy task to, to, to make sure that Zoom runs accordingly. And so thank you, nice, Lauren, as well. Nice. Um, so thank you, Artu. Thank you, V. Um, I hope everybody found the event valuable. I think we, we learned a lot. Uh, we'd obviously seen a lot of the presentations beforehand and they were really, really interesting. And it's great to see technology in action and making a positive difference in the conservation space. So with that, thank you, everyone. Your time is much appreciated. Go and enjoy the rest of GIS Day and um, we hope to see you next time in person. So thanks very much. Thanks, Lauren.